Scotland and one to look at what we can do in order to get much more consistency approach across all of the local authorities in this area. Thank you. That ends uh, the topical question period. The next site of business is a debate on motion number 9915 in the name of Aileen Campbell on the National Youth Work Strategy. Our ambitions for improving the life chances of young people in Scotland. And I'll give a few moments for uh, the front benches to sort themselves out. I call Eileen Campbell to speak and move the motion. Uh, can I just say to members that um, the presiding officers can be fairly generous in the amount of time that you take. So if you wish to take interventions, we would very much um, support you in doing so and make sure that you um, get the time back. So can I now call on Eileen Campbell to speak to move the motion, Minister? Ten minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, today's debate is about primarily welcoming the publication of the Youth Work Strategy, but also, I think, and importantly, it's an opportunity to recognise and celebrate the contribution of youth work and community learning and development in young people's lives and its contribution to our broader aim in the Scottish Government of making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. Now, the strategy called Our Ambitions for Improving the Life Chances of Young People in Scotland was developed in really deep collaboration and partnership, in particular with YouthLink Scotland and Education Scotland. But it also saw the input from a variety of youth work organisations from the length and breadth of Scotland, culminating finally in the publication of the strategy on the 3rd of April. And I would like to place on record my thanks to all those who worked tirelessly to develop the strategy and who will have a key role in shaping and delivering its implementation. Now, we developed a strategy because, as a government, we place a great value on the significant contribution that youth work and community learning and development are making in helping us to realise our ambition and vision for our country. That is, to improve outcomes and to build a nation that is full of opportunity and aspiration for our young people. And youth work is happening everywhere. Translated into real life, this means that in almost every village, town and city, youth work and community learning and development is happening across all of our communities. It's helping young people make positive choices as they emerge into adulthood, building their confidence, capacity and skills for further learning and employability. It's empowering young people to take control of their lives, building on their assets and helping young people deal with the challenges and adversity that can often happen in their lives by enabling and empowering them to build on what is positive to make their lives better. And all of this is delivered because of the talents and skills of thousands of youth workers, many of whom are volunteers giving up their own time to support and nurture our young people. Indeed, some of those, young, uh, those people are young people themselves, supporting their peers to be all that they can be and giving back to their communities. And I've said this many times before, but it's well worth repeating. Youth work represents the ultimate form of preventative spend. It is, as Professor Howard Sercombe suggests, provides the scaffolding of support for young people as they prepare to enter into the adult world and allows that entry to be positive and fulfilling. And one of the fantastic parts of this post is getting to see examples of youth work in action up and down the country. And over the last few months, I've been privileged to attend a number of youth work projects and events across the country real-life examples that better capture the importance of youth work and its transformative abilities. Now, I've been impressed and humbled by the commitment, the passion and the dedication shown by many youth workers, each motivated by the desire to improve our young people's well-being and life chances. And certainly I recognise in Kezia Dugdale's amendments the, 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 what she is trying to do within that is to recognise that within today's uh, debate. Now, earlier today, I visited the Green Shoot programme that was working with young people in East Lothian. And on top of meeting modern apprentices, primary sevens building dens and doing environmental art and clearing ditches with a young guy called Anthony, we announced that YouthLink will administer over £2 million of cashback funding to support the life-changing work that is delivered by youth work to organisations right across Scotland. Now, I think there's a, a lovely, nice, neat narrative around cashback. It seizes the proceeds of crime and reinvests it back into opportunities for our young people. 
and also at the recent Youth Work Awards, the stories of all the finalists was an absolute inspiration through the tireless work so many do to support our young people. Intergenerational work, volunteering, music, arts, um, drama, the variety on offer by Youth Work is phenomenal and it's right that we celebrate it at those Youth Work, uh, Youth Link's annual awards. Also at the 20th an 25th anniversary celebration of LGBT Youth Scotland, I listened to the young people's emotional stories about how LGBT youth workers had positively impacted on their lives over the years, providing them with the, with the support and nurture they require when coming out or just looking for a helping hand to cope. And in my own constituency area, I'm also very aware of the breadth of uh, activities for young people. The uniformed organisations, I was pleased to see in the Sunday Herald just this weekend, uh, a, a positive story about the scouting uh, movement, which is seeing numbers and diversity in terms of its membership grow and grow. And if you haven't had a chance to read that article, I would thoroughly recommend that you do. Oh, did you not? Ken, Ken McIntosh seemed to have missed the Sunday Herald. I've no idea why he would possibly have missed the Sunday Herald <laughs> publication. I think it was sold out across the length and breadth of the country. But no, nonetheless, I'm sure it was because of the, the scouting uh, article that he uh, missed, unfortunately. There you are. Yes. Ian MacArthur. Taking an intervention. On the issue of um, scouting, I've had various conversations with the uh, scout groups in my own constituency in Orkney, and where they're very uh, active, they're very grateful for the, the funding that's available. Most of this seems to be concentrated on uh, providing equipment and, and that sort of thing. Less is available for um, travel costs, which can be considerable in getting from Orkney to um, national events uh, down in the central belt, or indeed overseas when meeting scout groups from across Europe. Is that something that the government may be able to take a look at and see if there's opportunities for expanding access to, to those sorts of uh, events uh, to scouts in my constituency? Minister. Um, I know that we do support the uniform groups through the strategic funding partnerships and again though on the specific issue that uh, Lee MacArthur raises about uh, the groups in his own constituency I'm happy to meet with him to uh, discuss those specific issues. Yes. Is it a good I thank the Minister for giving way. She just mentioned the strategic partnership funds. I wonder if she could comment on the funding arrangements for youth work in Scotland. I understand in 2013 she operated two separate pots of money and that caused some confusion in the sector. Is she any plans to bring them together into the next financial year? Well, actually, we've held a number of uh, events to uh, further support the groups, whether they're third sector early intervention, the funding through the third sector early intervention fund or through the strategic funding partners and those have been welcomed by uh, groups in receipt of both those organisations. There is a period of review that we will take uh, but also within uh, the, 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 this funds there is also uh, a period in which they can um, self-evaluate how they have found uh, that support and we'll listen very carefully to the groups that have been involved uh, in both uh, funding uh, mechanisms. Um, in my own constituency, yes, bigger youth project, universal connections, and the Duke of Edinburgh are some of the services that are being delivered uh, in, a, in a positive way to contribute to young people's well-being, confidence and life chances. And it also, at the launch of the youth strategy, we heard from very articulate and confident young people talking about how they had been supported through youth work. And one young man described how he, his confidence had grown and how he had avoided a negative path and how he, he was now wanting to work in youth work. Another girl described how her confidence had increased through being a member of the Guides. And her words were incredibly powerful when she told us that she joined the Guides as a girl and would leave as a woman. The common thread, though, from all of these young people's stories I heard that day and witnessed through my visits is that youth work provides opportunities to be with their friends and peers and have fun while learning and being active. Whatever the activity, youth work's purpose is to build young people's self-esteem, confidence and sense of well-being, develop their ability to manage relationships, help them learn new skills and problem solve and improve their life chances. In thousands of instances, young people themselves are youth work volunteers, taking the lead, thinking creatively and supporting their peers to be all they can and make positive life choices. And through our funding for youth work and community learning and development, we have invested tens of millions of pounds in projects and facilities for young people and the communities that they live in. We also continue to work with the youth work sector to deliver programmes such as Active Girls, Stand Up to Sectarianism, No Lives, Better Lives and Activity Agreements. Through these projects, this government seeks to empower young people as well as improve their life chances and well-being. And this all fits within our aim to recognise, respect and promote children's rights and to get it right for every child. Youth work at its best recognises young people as equal partners in a learning process. It links them to their communities and engages them in local and national activities and decision-making processes. It helps young people to navigate 
the challenges of adolescence and recognises that some young people might need more help than others at particular times in their lives. Ultimately, youth work empowers young people, widens their horizons and builds their resilience and capacity to make the transition into further learning. Now, returning to the theme of partnership working, the Christie Commission challenged government to deliver services that people and communities deserve. It challenged us to do so by working in partnership and mutual respect. The development of this strategy is very much in keeping with the Christie principles. It's very easy to talk about partnership working, but it's much harder to do it effectively. And quite simply, the youth work strategy would not have been possible without everyone involved having a shared commitment to making it a reality. And that includes the strategic partners, YouthLink Scotland, the government who facilitated the national discussions which took place right across the country, but also the hundreds of people involved in voluntary and third sector organisations who took part in the national discussion which shaped the final strategy doc document. And I'm pleased that the youth work strategy has been very well received from across the sector. The feedback from the workshops and discussions which took place across the country has been incredibly positive. But the launch is only the beginning and the real work in a sense starts now and indeed has already started. Our ambitions for young people in Scotland states that we will put young people at the heart of policy, recognise the value of youth work, build workforce capacity, ensure that we measure our impact and ensure that Scotland is the best place to be young and to grow up in. To realise these ambitions, YouthLink Scotland, working in partnership with Education Scotland, the Government and key partners, including the CLD Standards Council, will implement the action plan which underpins the strategy, including raising the profile and promoting the benefits of youth work, developing strategies where young people's voices are heard and listened to, developing the youth work workforce to build a sustainable learning culture, and improving performance to demonstrate more effectively how youth work improves young people's wellbeing and life chances. There's a lot to do, but together we can pro properly articulate the importance of this sector and to illustrate the benefits it brings, not just to young people themselves, but wider society, our communities and, of course, our country. So, Providing Officer, I want again to thank everyone involved in the strategy's development and look forward to continuing that open relationship. And with MSPs across the Chamber, who I know equally value Youth Work's contribution, I look forward to working with each and every one of them to drive further forward our youth work uh, and our youth work workers to help young, more young people emerge into adulthood with confidence and the ability to contribute to the future of our country. Thank you. I now call... I now call Kaiser Dugdale to speak to a move of amendment number 9815.1. Ms Dugdale, seven minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I welcome the opportunity to debate the strategy this afternoon, uh, welcome the strategy uh, and welcome the cash announcement from the Minister. Uh, three welcomes right at the outset. I think we're looking forward to a positive afternoon. Um, I chaired the cross-party group on children and young people along with uh, Marco Biaggi and uh, we are very reliant on the help and support of YouthLink Scotland to operate the secretariat for that group. The advantage of having YouthLink Scotland so involved in that work is that we are able to get YouthWorks perspective on the whole education and children and young people's agenda at all stages. I think that is a really important point to get across to the Minister uh, in, in light of the fact that perhaps the YouthWork sector does not always get the recognition that it deserves in terms of its contribution to public policy uh, and I think at least today we can mark that uh, ourselves. So what does um, youth work mean? What does it deliver? What does it do? Well, I think it's four things. I think it's skills, a, a sense of self-confidence, a degree of resilience uh, and a sense of community. And uh, to see those four things in practice, I can see every day uh, in the part of East Edinburgh where I live, where you've got the youth buzz or the buzz, as it's called, locally in Lock End Restorig. I'd encourage the minister to go and see that and work. That's a mobile um, youth work bus that goes around different parts of the east of Edinburgh. And there's a direct correlation between where the youth bus is and antisocial behaviour calls into the police, because wherever the youth bus is, whether it's in Lock End or Restorig or a different part of the east end of Edinburgh, calls to the police dip because young people are actively engaged in the service, there's things to do, um, there are Xboxes and computer games and all the rest of it, but there's also employability support there too. Uh, young people are helped and supported to develop their CVs, they can access sexual health advice and a number of other services which I'll we'll come on to shortly. <coughs> Elsewhere in the east end of uh, Edinburgh, I think it's worth recognising the work of uh, Kids in the Street, uh, run by Kevin Finlay and the team and Craig Miller, who have got a mobile football unit that they can take out and provide uh, active services um, to the communities there. And I think, um, I'm sure we'll hear more from this from Liz Smith as she's speaking, but the valuable role that sport plays with youth work in, in particular. 
Those two organisations just point uh, to two examples of the tremendous dedication of staff and volunteers involved in youth work every day, and that's why the Labour bench has sought to put that amendment to the government. And I get the sense from the Minister that she's looking to accept that at the end of the day, which is good to hear, and I thank her for that. I think it's worth recognising that staff and volunteers, um, certainly the staff in particular, are not motivated by pay. Um, they're motivated by a, a much higher reward than that. And the individuals I know in the East End of Edinburgh have a passion, a driving passion for their community. But they also see the good in every single young person in their community and the ability that those individuals have to fulfil their potential with a degree of help and support. I think uh, we underestimate the contribution that youth workers make to our communities at, at our peril. I say that they're not motivated by, by money, but that doesn't mean we should disregard it as an issue. Uh, a lot of youth workers that I come across uh, are very reliant on, on sessional pay. They don't know how many hours they're getting from one week to the next. They don't have a tremendous amount of job security um, there. And much of their work is tied to the funding bids that those youth work organisations rely on. And it can be multiple sources of funding, multiple sources of short-term funding in particular, which means that even the smallest organisations need the brightest of accountants and the best people people working the books to make sure there's enough money there uh, year in, year out. And I would ask... Uh, sure. Nigel Don. I, I, I'm grateful. This is taking me back a bit, but I do recall the days when I had to do with this, uh, this, this kind of work that it was possible for those involved to spend far too much of their time raising money, and it could almost become its own activity rather than working with the youngsters. Has anything changed in the past few years? Is, I guess, a question you might be able to address, please. Is it like I think it's fair to say some progress has been made, but, but not enough. And I think charities involved in all sorts of work, third sector organisations right across different por uh, policy portfolios, look to the government to try and address some of these funding challenges, to try and find mechanisms for providing long-term funding. Uh, increasingly, I hear people talking about not just wanting three-year funding, now wanting five-year funding, so that there's at least more than one year in the middle where they can just get on the business of what they're doing rather than setting things up or closing down accounts. And I think there's a challenge to all government ministers to think about how they can provide provide uh, more sustainable funding options for groups that do such critical work. Um, the government motion focuses on positive choices, uh, and I want to focus on that in particular in the time that I've got, presiding officer. Uh, Liam McCarthy has already mentioned the Scouts. Can I mention the Girl Guides and in particular work that they're doing over the past couple of years, particularly around campaigning. They've now developed a campaigning badge uh, for Girl Guides to undertake, and I think they're doing some tremendous work around the No More Page 3 campaign. And uh, I'm particularly drawn to the work they're doing around body confidence and the body confidence revolution that they've got. Uh, a recent Girl Guides uh, attitude survey pointed to the fact that one in five primary school kids um, have been on a diet, primary school kids. 38% of all 11 to 21 year olds have skipped a meal to lose weight. And 87% of young women think they're judged more on their looks than their ability. I think we need to recognise the role that youth work, that Girl Guides and other organisations like that can play in tackling some of those endemic issues, trying to promote a more uh, a better sense of well-being, a more positive outlook on body image. Uh, and I think that that would go a long way to addressing the uh, body image crisis that our country currently faces. Another part of that agenda is sexual health, and I would encourage the Minister to look very carefully at the relationship between youth work and sexual health services. I'm quite disturbed by what's happening in Edinburgh at the moment, where dedicated sexual health services for young people are being removed, or at least the funding for them is being removed by the NHS, who are looking to mainstream it into core services. I think that's going to put young people off accessing sexual health and advice. I think it will lead to an increase in STIs if we're not careful. We need to recognise the importance of dedicated services for young people. And as I said right at the outset, Officer, very often youth work services integrate sexual health services into all the other type of work that, we're, that they're doing. So I would ask her to look at what she can do within her government department to work with the health department to make sure that young people access the services that they need. Organisations like Caledonian Youth are also uh, receive money to provide sexual education in schools and that money is currently under threat as well, again with local authorities looking to save that cash and deliver it themselves. I don't know if the Minister remembers her own experience of sexual education in school but getting it from your usual teacher wasn't the greatest thing. It's probably a better idea that somebody out with the school environment comes in with the expertise to talk about sex and talk about relationships in a way that young people do. Uh, I think that's uh, sorely missed if we lose out on that and I encourage her to look at trends in that direction. So we need to be careful that we don't turn young people off access in sexual health services and value the role that youth work plays in doing that because ultimately it's the duty of youth workers to minimise risk-taking behaviour. 
I'll just keep talking, Fred, and yeah, you're giving me the nod there, okay. So Caledonian youth, although they're losing out on core services within the health department and uh, core services within education, they still provide important work in our prisons. And I don't know if the minister is aware of education work that Caledonian youth do in a number of prisons across the country, providing one-to-one -one dedicated uh, advice um, for young people who have an experience of uh, the criminal justice system, really intensive work that uh, makes a uh, substantial change to lives. I know that Caledonian youth would like to um, roll that out if the Minister, I'd like to comment on that. Minister. I'm not necessarily aware of specifically, but certainly I'm very, it's an area I'm very interested in about what more we can do with uh, young people, particularly who are in prison. And certainly I know the work that families outside SPPA and others have done around parenting has had maybe similar, um, a con a similar outcomes in terms of building confidence and making sure that once a, a person's out with prison, that they can go on to lead much more positive lives and have much less likelihood of going back into the prison and stops that, unnecessary, uh, that vicious cycle of reoffending. I'd agree with the Minister entirely on that basis. It's about that transition into adulthood and also the roles and responsibilities, whether that be around sexual health, and parenting, drug taking, all sorts of risk behaviour that, that can um, be affected with the right sort of approach here. So I just repeat that call to the Minister to work with our colleagues in Justice and Health and in other departments to make sure it's joined up. In closing, Presiding Officer, you'll hear from three uh, Labour speakers this afternoon. Graham Pearson will talk a little bit more about youth work and the link with youth justice. Ken McIntosh will ask some hard questions about the strategy and the degree to which the monitoring and evaluation framework exists and Siobhan McMahon will ask some hard questions about the money and whether the money matches the mission that's been set out today. That said, uh, very much welcome the strategy and look forward to the debate this afternoon. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Mary Scanlon. Ms Scanlon, you've five minutes plus. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just say at the Education Committee this morning, uh, in relation to a petition, uh, I put on the record that I support the government. And uh, it was also heard from SNP members that they agreed with something that I said. And uh, I realise it's very unusual in this run-up uh, to September the 18th. But I do feel that this afternoon is such a debate uh, that it is consensual, and I would like presiding officer to thank the two speakers before me for their you know, very uh, positive, constructive uh, approach that they've given. And uh, whilst I'm uh, uh, at this stage, I would also we're obviously supporting the government uh, motion, and I think the amendment from the Labour Party is indeed uh, highly valued. It's well worthwhile, and we support that as well. Um, but I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to put on the record the support of my party, Scottish Conservatives, for the National Youth Work Strategy, recently published by uh, Scottish Government in accordance with uh, Education Scotland, YouthLink uh, Scotland and many others. There can be absolutely no disagreement with the aims, objectives and outlines, uh, uh, aims and objectives outlined in this strategy. Uh, improving social and health outcomes, deepening community involvement uh, and understanding communities and developing core skills, youth work has a hugely important role today. As I said last December, when George Adam selected YouthLink Scotland for a members debate, uh, for too long the terms youth worker and unsung hero uh, have gone hand in hand. I think that was really a very good debate and it did put on record the value uh, that we hold in youth work. Therefore, I particularly welcome the emphasis within the strategy on promoting the value of youth work and developing the skills of the workforce. I think we often get uh, caught up in skills in terms of qualifications, and I actually think that one of the great benefits for uh, youth work and uh, the benefits to youth is actually working in a team. Uh, it's about timekeeping. It's about getting on with people that are older than yourself. Uh, and it's about work experience. And it's much simpler than actually saying there has to be a tick box and a qualification at the end of it. But to take the first of these points, a national communication strategy would not only boost the appeal of the sector, it would also alert more young people to the range of opportunities on offer. The National Youth Worker Awards are a good example of this, but as the strategy recognise, recognises, we can and we should do more to extol the virtues of the sector and make clear how it has the potential to develop, uh, develop and benefit 
uh, our young people. And I thought Liam MacArthur made a very good point about young people from the Highlands and Islands. And there are additional costs if we want them to, for example, the Scouts, Boys Brigade and others, uh, if we want them to meet with people in other areas. A stronger evidence base would certainly help in uh, this overall regard. And so I fully support the ambition articulated in the strategy for a research project which would establish how youth work helps to deliver strategic policy objectives. And just as I was listening to the Minister, I think it's also important uh, that youth work be aligned as much as possible to the government's economic strategy, uh, given the recent concerns that were raised by the Auditor General with regard to modern apprenticeships, which at that, in the Auditor General report, modern apprenticeships were not aligned to the government strategy. And I put that in as a positive suggestion. But this is particularly true when it comes to those who have perhaps begun to disengage from mainstream society. YouthLink, for instance, provided evidence to the Parliament's Finance Committee, which cited research regarding how disadvantaged young people were engaging, as others have said, with youth work service services. Uh, that research found that school attendance improved, temporary exclusions were reduced, and antisocial behaviour fell. So these are hugely encouraging signs and point to the societal value of youth work initiatives. And we're constantly being asked about school exclusions, and this is actually something positive that can be done in order to bring uh, people back into engagement. Of course, to function, these initiatives depend upon a large number of volunteers, and it's to this group I now turn. Volunteers, it seems, are frequently taken for granted, as uh, Kezia Dugdale has just mentioned, and not afforded the same opportunities to develop as workers in other sectors. To address this, the strategy appears to envisage a broader role for the CLD Standards uh, Council for Scotland, with particular emphasis on working with YouthLink to develop support and training for volunteers. I welcome this focus and the drive towards establishing national standards for youth work. These standards are due to be developed and implemented over the two years to March 2016. And if done with due care, there is undoubtedly potential to bring more rigour to how youth work is organised and delivered. So this deputy presiding officer can only be a good thing, especially if it convinces more young people to give up their time to become involved with youth work projects and such initiatives from a core part of community learning and development with the potential to improve life opportunities for young people, their families and the wider communities that they're part of. So, uh, in summing up, I very much welcome this strategy. I support its key goals and uh, I, I look forward uh, to perhaps digging deeper into the disengagement and exclusions from schools. And I would trust that that's something that uh, we will look forward to in future. And in particular, the attainment gap and uh, the dips in performance. I'll close, please. Right, I'll close now. Thanks so much. Uh, now, move to open debate. Um, call on George Adam to be followed by Graham Pearson, please. A Thank you, President. Four Thank minutes. you, President Officer. I welcome the publication of the National Youth Work Strategy and agree with the Minister when she says that the opportunities that youth work can offer our young people can make a massive difference in their lives. Youth work is making a significant contribution to our vision of the kind of Scotland being the best place for our children to uh, best people in the world for our children to grow up. Early intervention is extremely important because it's been mentioned by some of the other members uh, the fact that if we do manage to get to individuals at a certain time, it can make a difference in their life. And this is a point I'll probably come back to later on in my speech. You know, there are many youth works working within all our communities and they continue to do fantastic work. Paisley and District Boys Brigade made Derek Mackay and myself honorary vice presidents. Not bad for two boys that were never in the BB to begin with. 
Uh, myself, I was a scout. I was in the Bushies Cubs only because I was freakishly tall at the time and they needed a centre half for the football team. So they effectively that was the reason why I ended up. But that's an example of the kind of activities that draw people into youth uh, organisations. And during my time, there was people from all types of backgrounds and all types of different things I've done with their life from then on. And I think we still, thanks to the power of social media, we still manage to keep in touch with one another just now. But I think it's important that we look at some of the things that uh, have been made available in our own areas. Within Paisley, the St Martin Street Stuff programme has been extremely successful so much so that I've mentioned it before in various other debates and they've probably won more trophies than the actual football club that they represent as well although last year we did manage to win one but it attracts over 15,000 young people uh, each year and is run in partnership with Renfrewshire Council Police Scotland, Engage Renfrewshire Summerton FC and West College Scotland and how it works is very similar to what Kez, Kezia Dugdale mentioned in Edinburgh is that they have identified hotspots where there is youth disorder and they've gone into the these areas. In some areas of Paisley, and Paisley South in particular, in my old council ward, the uh, areas uh, disorder has been reduced by up to 25 per cent. Now, this is quite an incredible difference because these people have the credibility. The people of these community coaches are from St Martin FC. They have the credibility that a lot of workers that work with the local authority or other organisations don't have when they're talking to these young people and are able to be approached and talk to them about various things. But the beauty about this programme is it gives young people the access to various other things. There is a, there is a bus, a, a, there's actually a fitness bus as well available in part of it as well and it's all about health and well-being but St Martin haven't just done that what they've also done as well is they've made sure that they've had a uh, a music partnership, giving them an opportunity for young people to get involved in music. So they're taking their whole idea of being a community football club to the next level because people would rather go to the football club. Another example I heard the other day was about uh, some fathers who couldn't cook in Fergusley Park in Paisley and uh, their children going together to St Martin. The children played football and for a while and the dads were actually taken up to the hospitality area and taught how to cook a meal. Then the children came back and they all sat together and they had a meal together. Now that might seem like a strange thing for someone to do. But when we have record numbers of parents not being able to cook a fresh meal for people, this can make a difference. So my idea would be, how do we take this to the next level? How do we take these ideas that we've got in our local communities like this in St Martin and take it to the next level? Because obviously they're currently doing employ employability and training as well. So why don't we look at this as a potential hub, an opportunity for us to be able to kind of use the credibility of that local asset and make sure that we can make a difference in these young people's lives? Now, in my area, St Martin Football Club are in Fergusley Park, one of the areas of multiple deprivation, the lowest uh, the, in the whole of Scotland. Now, I would say that if we can use and work together with them and take these ideas and take them to the next level, I'm working with all the partner groups there. It's about access to education. It's about access to health and wellbeing. It's about access to employability. If I can get all this together locally, I think the important thing for us is to look at how we can do it. It's not just all about national government putting money down the way. It's about us trying to find other ways to make ideas like this work and take them to the next level. As Kezia Dugdale already said, we have a situation where some of these groups are looking for funding on a yearly basis. So why don't we look at a way of making these projects larger locally? Now, I would say that we've got a situation where it's up to myself and other elected members in our area to work together to actually get this ideal. And in closing, presiding officer, I would say, you know, there is an awful lot of great work going on out there in youth work. But I think we're at the stage now where we have to take it to the next stage to actually look at a way that we can all work together to make sure that we can make a difference to these young people's lives in our community. Many thanks. Now Colin Graham Pearson to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, first of all, can I congratulate the Government, the Minister, in being able to bring forward such a positive motion, one that uh, achieves the support of uh, these benches, uh, and together with the amendment from uh, Kezia Dugdale. Uh, second, I think it's right, as others have, have mentioned, that uh, we should acknowledge the Youth Link Scotland, Education Scotland, Scotland, a Scottish Youth Parliament, together with um, Caledonia Youth and many of the unnamed third sector and voluntary groups who work tirelessly with young people day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. Uh, 
a lot has been said about the necessity of, of youth support in terms of youth work. Uh, and I would support all that has been said in the Chamber. Uh, I don't suggest that the particular focus that I will place in my contribution is more significant or less significant than the others have mentioned. But my experience in a previous life with Polmont and Corton Vale Prison meant that I felt it right that I should focus particularly on the youth work that is done in these establishments. Uh, only this morning I received a letter from a mother that I haven't seen in seven years, and by a complete accident the letter arrived today indicating that seven years ago I met her and her son at a Pullman prison. Uh, the son was involved in voluntary work at the prison in connection with Choices for Life, a drugs education programme at the time. And along with 20 other prisoners, they self-organised themselves onto three shifts, including a night shift within the prison, to organise goodie bags that were necessary across Scotland and provided to all the children who attended the event. 70,000 bags uh, created and delivered within three weeks and all elegantly packed and properly delivered. The pride that that young man took in being involved in that event, along with much other work done within the prison, has meant that in the seven intervening years, he's not been involved in crime again, he hasn't been back in prison again, and he has a sense of self. And, and that one example uh, leads me to believe that the outside-in service, which is currently delivered, and previously known as the Scottish Prison Service Youth Work Service, is absolutely necessary in adding to the quality of work that can be done in prisons. Uh, both young men and young women within our prison suffer from low self-esteem, an absence of confidence, a knowledge of where they fit into the world and how they can have a future. Youth work conducted within these establishments help to deal with issues of skills, of confidence, of bullying, uh, difficulties in terms of health, sexual health, difficulties in terms of peer group pressure, uh, equality, diversity, anti-racism, all these issues need to be tackled, but particularly in circumstances where for any amount of reasons, no one else is there to give you that kind of support. The kind of work that's offered by those engaging in youth work across Scotland is vital to enable these young people to get the chance, the opportunity to participate in the future. So to that extent, only a fool would want to resist Aileen Campbell's motion and acknowledge the amendment uh, that is part of our discussions today. And hopefully, uh, I'm not a fool. Uh, the stresses that these young people face, particularly in circumstances where the economic environment that we live in make life so very tough for us all, is such that we need to invest in the future. And to that extent, I would first of all acknowledge the key role of youth work I would want that all of our young people should get access to the support of youth workers because we don't know at what time and in what circumstances young people need that support, no matter their social background, no matter the circumstances that they face. I also think that uh, although the strategy is enormously positive, as you would expect, I would want it to be more ambitious and provide the real a bridge that's so necessary to bring these young people into the mainstream. And the long-term funding has been commented uh, previously. The last thing I would say is we need measurable outcomes so we know the money invested in these circumstances is positively used. So I'm happy to support the motion and the amendment and pleased to have been part of this discussion. Thank you. Many hey, thanks. Now I call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Up to five minutes, Thank please. you very much, President uh, Can I thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward uh, this debate. I know that the Minister is driven by her ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world uh, to grow up, and that's surely an ambition that is uh, universally shared uh, across this uh, chamber. And clearly, formal structures of the state, education and health services in particular uh, have an obvious uh, huge role to play in that regard. Clearly, those bringing up uh, children have uh, the greatest part in my own position. I think the most important role I have 
in life as a, as a father to my own children. And I know that the Children and Young People's Bill was a hugely important step in the direction of improving the lives of Scotland's young people, particularly in regards to early intervention to improve outcomes for youngsters. And in this regard, and towards the ambitious drive towards making our country the best it can be for young people, the work done by those involved in youth work, often through informal and third sector organisations, is uh, uh, vital uh, because uh, we know that uh, the development, learning and experience that young people gain uh, are long lasting and can have uh, a positive impact, which is uh, uh, lifelong. And youth work can offer young people uh, options to help them make positive changes in their lives through initiatives like training, uh, youth award programmes, literacy and numeracy projects, anti violence initiatives, uh, and information participation in uh, citizenship uh, services uh, and programmes. So, uh, the publication of the national a youth work strategy is very uh, welcome, and particularly uh, if, if part of it I find welcome is its uh, partnership uh, approach, the fact that it has been developed uh, jointly by the Scottish Government, Education Scotland and Youth Link Scotland. I think Graeme Pearson was right to uh, place on record our thanks to those uh, organisations for having uh, come together and worked together to devise uh, the strategy. And it is obviously uh, vital that organisations involved in youth work are involved in that uh, strategy. And I want to mention uh, a few uh, organisations uh, in delivering uh, that youth work. I want to talk about the uh, Boys' Brigade. Unlike George Adam, I was once uh, a member. Uh, perhaps that might be why I have not been offered an honorific role, uh, unlike uh, uh, George Adam. But I have been very happy uh, to work uh, with uh, them in sponsoring events uh, here at Palm to uh, enable them to showcase uh, the work uh, they uh, are doing. And they uh, helpfully provided me uh, with a bit of background information uh, be in advance of the debate and uh, akin to the position of uh, the scouting organisations, uh, the uh, BB's membership uh, has increased and they have had 10 new uh, groups uh, uh, beginning, uh, starting since the beginning of uh, 2013. So there is clear uh, 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 growth uh, in activity and demand for uh, uh, the uh, services they uh, offer. And, uh, uh, they also want to make a place on record the fact that they have benefited uh, from cash back for communities, uh, small grants. Uh, uh, having been awarded last year some £40,000 to uh, 40, uh, 48 local uh, BB uh, groups. And in my own area, I have been able to see firsthand the uh, positive role uh, uh, they play in coming alongside a number of different BB companies uh, locally. They uh, pro uh, active participation and engagement uh, with young people in schemes such as the George VI Youth Leadership Course uh, and Young People Taking the Lead. And of course, they offer other developmental opportunities and uh, provide uh, uh, the youngsters there work with the ability to make decisions, take responsibility, make a difference to the lives of others through initiatives such as the, the Queen's Badge. And in 2013, uh, some 410 uh, youngsters had their efforts recognised uh, through the award of a, a Queen's Badge. I also want to, in the uh, short time left, me uh, mention a few other uh, organisations in my uh, uh, local area uh, engaged in uh, youth work. We have a local squadron of uh, the Air Cadets, led very ably by Flight Lieutenant Stevie uh, Cairns. I uh, have been very impressed whenever I have got to see them there, uh, equipping young people with skills and confidence that will see them through uh, the rest of their lives. Also very engaged uh, with the local community. We also have Common Old YMCA, YWCA, who are undertaking a range of uh, good work. But one of the uh, areas uh, that they are uh, involved in this uh, regard is providing decent after-school care, which is invaluable uh, to many families in the area. And, uh, recently, I was very happy to attend. I was very privileged to be asked to hand out the awards for a, a Duke of Edinburgh award ceremony at uh, New College uh, Lancashire's Cumbernauld uh, campus. And it was uh, positively inspirational to see uh, uh, the young people who had uh, given so much commitment to bettering themselves and their community uh, being, uh, having that commitment uh, awarded. Indeed, there was one really positive case where one youngster had a placement at a local employer and ended up getting a job out of that uh, placement. There are many other examples of, of good youth work locally. All these organisations rely on those who volunteer time uh, uh, to them. I think I'd work place and record my thanks to those who do so in Common Old Scythe. Very much welcome the amendment uh, from Kezia Dugdale in that regard. I'm hopeful that we, uh, 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 that I'm hoping that the main message that emerges from today's debate uh, is to go back to those people who volunteer their time to support youth work. I hope that can be one of the strongest messages that comes from this debate today. I very much welcome it, President Officer. Many thanks. Now, call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Christian Allard. Up to five minutes, please. 
Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start like Kezia Dugdale by welcoming the debate, the strategy uh, and uh, the money? Can I also um, I, I happily confirm that we will be uh, supporting the motion and indeed uh, the amendment, which I think, um, as the Minister rightly uh, suggested, does um, lay particular emphasis on the role of volunteers and others uh, in uh, supporting youth work. I think every speaker so far has um, uh, articulated the benefits of, of youth work, uh, and I wouldn't disagree with, uh, with any of them. YouthLink, in their briefing, point to the way in which it equips young people to deal with the, uh, what life throws at them, for better uh, or for worse. It changes lives overall uh, for the better, and I think delivers across a wide range of public policy objectives within health, education, culture, youth justice, etc. But YouthLink also, in their briefing, point to some of the challenges. Um, they suggest that changes in structures to take account of young people's needs uh, is necessary. And um, I, uh, I, I've been told on many, many occasions by uh, John Lawton, the former president of the Youth uh, Parliament, uh, and the inspiration behind Dare to Lead, that young people are not the future, they're the present. Their voices, their views, their needs need to be taken into account uh, now. They also point to uh, the need to link um, funding to the meeting of those objectives. And I think Kezia Dugdale made the point about um, the long-term nature of funding does help uh, th those decisions to be taken uh, about uh, how youth work can be uh, developed and sustained uh, over a period. And they also point to the need to win hearts and minds, which I have to say I found uh, slightly odd. The, the tone and the content of the debate today suggests um, there is no need to win hearts and minds, certainly in this chamber. Um, I think there have been examples of, of, of good work uh, right across the country so far, and I think all of those uh, echo my own experience uh, in Orkney, where volunteering, for example, goes uh, from strength to strength. Uh, I was invited to present the awards at uh, the Orkney Youth Awards uh, recently, and, and like the Minister, found the experience very humbling to see the, the volume, the variety, the quality of, of what goes on in my own constituency uh, laid out, presenting um, 228 Saltar certificates to young volunteers, from challenge certificate right up to those doing uh, 500 hours. I also awarded um, uh, to two young volunteers summit awards on outstanding uh, achievements and contributions uh, to volunteering. So I, I don't think there's any need to sell uh, volunteering to, to um, young constituents uh, in Orkney. And it's also borne out uh, by the 2012 Scottish Household Survey, uh, which suggests that um, people aged between 16 to 39 um, recorded a 55% rate uh, of people volunteering over the last 12 months in Orkney, compared to a national uh, Scottish figure of 29%, which I have to say struck me um, as uh, a surprisingly low, not least uh, given what other members have suggested is going on in their own constituencies uh, and regions. But leaving that uh, aside, I certainly take a great deal of encouragement and no little pride uh, in, uh, in what the Scottish Household Survey says about what's happening uh, in my own constituency. Voluntary Action Orkney have provided uh, some examples of, of, of the work that's going on. Friday Friends, for example, um, brings together uh, young people from Cutwell Grammar School with uh, older residents in the Union, Union's Enclosed Sheltered Housing uh, Scheme, uh, pulling together an intergenerational approach, which I think other members have alluded to, breaking down some of the barriers, some of the preconceptions uh, between uh, young and old. And having visited the, the project myself, um, it was very evident to me uh, that the benefits were felt uh, on, on both sides. Uh, similarly, the Memories Project with uh, pupils from Stromness Academy Academy, uh, are bringing together uh, younger people uh, who are then able to uh, interview um, older members of the uh, community, uh, recording their experience of the war history, their work, their family life, uh, etc. Recording that, editing it, uh, presenting a copy to the individuals themselves, but also placing copies in the Orkney Library and Archive, which I think will be hugely beneficial going forward. There are other opportunities for volunteering around the Orkney Folk Festival later this month, the St Magnus Festival next month, uh, and the Strength of the Duke of Edinburgh uh, Awards in Orkney is one of those um, idiosyncrasies that pop up uh, from time to time. Girl Guiding, I think, was referred to by Kezia Dugdale, and I think some of their campaigning work in relation to uh, young women and uh, mental health issues, I think, has been truly uh, phenomenal. I should declare an interest as a, as a guiding ambassador, and, and like George Adam, I should make clear uh, this was not born out of my membership of the Girl Guides uh, back in the day. Uh, but there are issues there that, that are facing uh, voluntary groups and those working in, youth, in the youth work sector uh, in Orkney. The cost of PV, uh, PVGs can act as an obstacle uh, for placing uh, volunteers. Uh, I, I also understand that de developing the partnerships so that young people's achievements can be recognised and recorded.
and the point about funding, which I referred to earlier, helping support the additional costs of travel. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the debate. I pay tribute to those involved, both young people and those who help support them. There are undoubted benefits to young people, uh, but I think, as others have referred to, it's hard to imagine what Orkney would look like without the work that they contribute to the com community I represent. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Now, call on Christian Allard to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Up to five minutes, please. President Officer, I'm delighted to take part to this debate and to recognise, promote and celebrate the value of our fantastic youth workers improving young people's life chances across Scotland. We have much to learn from each of us, sharing our own expertise and experience, as we must not only value our achievements, but young people's achievements too. I want Scotland to be the best place in the world for my children, my grandchildren, and all young people to grow up just like the Minister said earlier on. The role of public and voluntary services is pivotal in achieving this, to ensure that our services for young people are fit for the 21st century Scotland. Uh, this youth work strategy is for me the best way to build a fairer society. We already have a strong youth work sector, one that empowers young people to improve their own well-being and life chances. One that needs funding, of course, like some members have already added it to. I do welcome, for example, the, the announcement today of the 2.1 million cash back funding for Scotland's youth projects. It's Youth Link Scotland that administers, administers this funding, presenting officer, to build the capacity of young people and the youth work organisation who work to support them. In the North East, as the region I represent, cash back for communities youth work awards made a real difference last year. In Aberdeenshire, uh, we received a total of £30,530, of which Aberdeenshire Youth Council re received £2,580. And as much as Aberdeen Youth Council, it's a different part of what we are talking about today. I would like to emphasize the fact that a lot of people who were going into this Youth Council originate, first of all, from youth work. It's people who have been attending this organized uh, 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 volunteer organization and who have given this great help from youth workers. And I've seen that at, uh, uh, in Inverurie on the 14th of September 2013, where a lot of uh, organizations uh, came together and supported the Aberdeenshire Youth C Council uh, that organised an anti-bullying awareness parade. And this kind of parade was very, very important. It shows the community in Inverurie uh, that it was an opportunity to stand up to bullying and provide an occasion to showcase services that are available to young people for support and advice. And we should always remember this. This is a lot about empowering young people and making themselves uh, being the focus of what can be done, how it can be done, and how it can be delivered. Uh, Cashback for Communities Youth Work Awards uh, was very important in Aberdeen as well, with £21,000. Uh, some of this money, uh, short of £3,000, went to the Youth Outreach Bus Trust, and we talked, we talked about that. I think buses are quite important, and they can help very much reaching these the young people, and they are a great place for, for youth workers to, uh, to, to work in, and I, I happened to have visited one in Aberdeen, and I think they were quite fantastic, and, and I really enjoyed uh, uh, using some of the device that we had. Uh, Angus had a total of £9,000 uh, last year, and then the total of £13,000. In my own community in West Hill, presenting officer in Aberdeenshire, I can say that uh, as a past member of the West Hill Community Development Group, I witnessed at first hand the invaluable contribution of our youth workers, past and present. I recall how pivotal the way in having our young people involved in the Making It Real planning exercise, an exercise uh, which was a community effort to plan for the future of our own community. And this is, again, very important, President Officer, to have young people very much involved in our future in contributing to how we should build our own community. And uh, this effort, so generation working together for the benefit of all. Uh, I'd like to say at that point that uh, Western volunteers, youth workers, and young people vis visited, visited other communities across Aberdeenshire, and one of them being Peterhead. And uh, we visited in Peterhead the hotspot, a community hub for all. And I just noticed that uh, young people from P7 of Peterhead Central Schools uh, join us today, and I'm sure they, they know very well about the hotspot. As a vision from this government is clear, early intervention and preventative spending deliver better outcomes for our young people. We want all young people to have the skills for lifelong learning and work 
There is another aspect to this vision. Greater integration and partnership at local level is bringing our communities together. President Officer, there are many examples of community groups opening up to our young people, helping generations working together, like the member Jan Mark Arthur talked about, for the common good and for the development of individuals. As you so, draw to a close, please. Yes, to, to closing, President Officer, every day an army of youth workers and dedicated volunteers across Scotland are helping our young people to be successful, confident, effective and responsible individuals that Scotland needs in order to flourish. Thank you so much. Now we call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Bob Doris, up to five minutes. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate on the National Youth Work Strategy 2014-2019. Whilst the document has many good examples of youth work in practice and has a lot of warm and friendly ambitions for the future, incidentally I agree with them all, there is very little in the document that sets out the clear objectives for the ambitions. The document does not set out a clear strategy on how these ambitions are likely to be achieved, and there is no mention of how we will measure the implementation of the strategy or indeed measure the success of the ambitions. For instance, I was surprised that in the 36-page document there is not one reference to the financial implications of such a strategy. I do not think I am the only one, given that Youth Link Scotland have stated in a briefing for this afternoon's debate that there has been some movement on the funding front and we are working hard with the Scottish Government to make funding more sustainable. Youth Link Scotland want core funding to be made available as opposed to short-term project funding, so that the ambitions of the plan and other services that meet local needs over the long term can be met. I wonder if the Scottish Government will be able to comment in their closing speech as to what funding will be available on whether it's, or whether it is already up to local authorities and their partners to deliver the funding to enable the ambitions of the document to be achieved. The Minister will be aware that the first National Youth Strategy was published in 2007 and the financial package to support this strategy was also published at that time. The money that accompanied that document helped to support the ambitions of the strategy, particularly in supporting those in charge uh, of the vision, volunteers and the capital investment projects needed in order for the strategy to be achieved. The Distance Travelled Report, which commented on what had been done between 2007 and 2011, said that all targets had been met and many of them had been surpassed. I do not doubt that a lot of those targets that had been met were due to the hard work and determination of those individuals leading on the project, the volunteers and the communities who wish for the projects to succeed. However, I also do not doubt that the funding that was made available at the very start of the process would have played a major part in that. Therefore, I repeat my request for the Scottish Government to come up with a financial plan and package to support the ambitions of the current strategy. The document sets out five ambitions which I agree with entirely. However, the strategy does not give a lot of detail on how the ambitions will be met. I wonder if the Scottish Government will be publishing an accompanying document which will set out a more detailed plan on how the five key ambitions will be met. I understand that some of the ambitions will be implemented through Curriculum for Excellence and GIFREC. However, no further details have been given on how this will happen. Who will be responsible for the implementation of the ambitions through these policy areas? Will it be the government, local authorities, teachers, social workers, all of them, or will there be a lead person appointed? I also wonder if the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People will have a role in the development of this strategy. I presume that will be the case, but given there is no mention of him in the document, I would seek clarification on this. I would also ask that a more detailed time frame be published which will measure the ambitions of the strategy. I know that there is already a time frame published within the strategy, but that only sets out what the partners are aiming to do over the next few years. It does not say how the strategy will be measured and how we will know if the ambitions will be met in the time frame given. I understand that 2018 will be the year of young people in Scotland. I, like many people in this chamber, would like to see the ambitions contained in the strategy achieved and surpassed by them. We all want to see our young people achieve their potential and remove all the barriers that may be in their way at the present moment. The strategy that we are debating today will go some way in achieving that vision, but we should go further than this, and I hope that the Scottish Government will address the real concerns I and others have in relation to the document, in order that we can all work together to achieve the ambitions set out before us today. Thank you. Many thanks. 
Now Colin Bob Doris to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Up to five minutes, please. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I start off with an apology? I missed the first few minutes of the Minister's speech uh, at the start of the debate, and uh, my apologies uh, for, for that. I'll go back and read every word in the official report, Ms Campbell, uh, I assure you. C can I start off by, by, by mentioning uh, a, a local youth group in, in North Glasgow and some of the good work they do and tease out some of the wider issues in relation to, to youth work? Uh, uh, the Minister has already visited North United Communities and a visit to Wineford uh, a few years ago in relation to the good work they do. Well, North United Communities don't just do work in Wineford, but also in Maryhill, in Ruckhull, in Somerston, in Cadar, and in Milton. Indeed, their name used to be the Ruckhill Youth Project, but to uh, get away from territorialism and bring communities together, they, winded out, they widened out the work that they do across North Glasgow. But if you ask me, is it, is it, is it, is it, do they use football as a medium and to do their youth work, or do they use drama, or do they use arts, or do they use computer games? And I could go on. None of that. What they use is relationships, and that's the key to any, any good youth work. And that's some of the things I want to tease out during this debate, because getting young people to play football might be fine, but it's talking to the, the young male before the game and talking to him after the game, noticing when he's, there's, there's a particular issue with him, maybe having a word with the family member. That's proper youth work. Youth work is not about activities. It's about relationships. And activ the activities is a medium towards developing those relationships and helping young people. And I think that's something that needs to be put on the record here today. So let me just give you a couple of examples in relation to that, presiding officer. Uh, when there was uh, issues in Somerston behind, uh, in a lane behind John Paul Academy and the large secondary schools there, the approach from North United Communities was not to seek a, 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 a getting the, the police to go around and, and see what was going on. It was to hang out with the young people that were in the lanes behind John Paul Academy, just hang out with them and chat with them. And a few weeks later, they developed a, a programme of youth activities to engage with those young people. I can tell you the first few weeks they did it, they weren't particularly welcomed by the young people, but they persevered with them, they hung out with them, and they gained their respect. They did something very similar in Glasgow Milton. It's about relationship building with young people, those young people who are hardest to reach. You don't give up on them, you build relationships with them. And local grassroots based youth organisations are very much best placed to do that. And I'm sure this youth strategy is something that will be developed. If, if it's briefly, of course, yes. Yeah. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to Bob Doris. Would he um, agree that that rather underscores the point about getting as long-term funding as we can to allow those relationships to be built, built up and sustained over a period? Yeah. Bob Doris. I want to say a little bit more about long-term funding as well. What, there's a dichotomy with long-term funding, because I know sectors that have asked for it before. And if you go in for a grant for long-term funding and you're unsuccessful, sometimes you feel you're locked out for a long period of time as well. So there's a balance to be struck in relation to long-term funding that I think sometimes goes, goes awry when the discussions are held. But I do absolutely take on board the, the, the point you make. Let me tell you about a couple of issues North Central communities have. Quite often when they bid for projects, certainly in straightened uh, financial times, the local community planning partnership, uh, for example, uh, no longer gives a budget line for management costs for the, the youth organisation and they merely want to get a cost recovery for the, the youth work hours for sessional work in the community and I think understand why the community planning partnership is doing it but I feel it's a rather short-sighted and I think that's something that has to be taken into account and the second thing I would say and, and again I'm only talking about the local community planning partnership because that's what I get direct experience of I'm sure these th these themes and issues could be replicated uh, in, in other areas but once an area sees uh, good success with youth work so CADA in the north of Glasgow with the north end communities where we saw a, a reduced crime rate a reduced vandalism rate because of the success that North Atlantic communities did there, it becomes deprioritised. And as it becomes deprioritised, that means all the successful things that were taking cadre forward as a community stop happening. What they need is sustained long term commitment to that community after it achieves successes, not remove it because it achieves successes. But I want to finish in a, in a positive There's a huge opportunity in relation to to youth work, and that's in relation to European funding, and that's Erasmus+, Plus, which I think uh, uh, some members may, may not be aware of. That's uh, a, a European Union programme between 2014 and 2020, 14.7 billion euros, a 40% increase in Erasmus funding, and it's a new way of looking at Erasmus exchange, which in the past perhaps wrongly been stereotyped as uh, very able young people, middle class young people from comfortable backgrounds get in exchanges. Well, Erasmus Plus, and I quote, uh, are about grants will more strongly target specific needs such as living costs and, and destination countries 
targeting less, those from less privileged backgrounds. It's long-term funding, billions of euros, young people from, from uh, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. And I'm wondering if that's something, and it mentions youth Let work you and sport close, in specifics, Minister. I wonder if that's something you'd be keen to meet and engage with me on to see if we can develop a way of maximising youth groups from deprived areas across Scotland accessing some Erasmus Plus funding, because that would be a major opportunity for our deprived communities. Thanks so much. Now call on Ken McIntosh, after which we move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As with everyone in the Chamber today, uh, I can I welcome today's debate and the launch of the new National Youth Work Strategy. I have no doubt whatsoever it is very well intentioned. The sector itself is full of good people doing very good work and, in fact, in some cases, inspirational work. But I have to admit, I do find the strategy a little bit on the vague side, uh, a little lacking in specifics. And without wishing to be overly critical or to break the consensus this afternoon, it, it's written in that kind of opaque management speak that I find drains any real sense of drive or purpose. And while today's announcement on funding is welcome, uh, there are a few challenging targets. Of course, we all want Scotland to be the best place for a young person to grow up. And for many, it will be. But unfortunately, for too many others, it's also the most likely place to get stabbed to develop a drink problem, to become obese, or to start smoking. There are so many areas we should be tackling directly, but with limited time, Presiding Officer, the issue I want to focus on primarily today is smoking, or rather, vaping. Vaping is the new term for the use of e-cigarettes, which give off a cloud of vapour rather than tarry smoke. It is a term, of course, coined by advertisers promoting a new and what they hope will be an attractive product. I can't say I'd paid a great deal of attention to e-cigarettes until a very helpful discussion I had with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society last week. If anything, I thought there were a safer alternative to smoking, a way of encouraging smokers to give up the habit. And that probably is still true for the majority of adult smokers. But there's also a very real danger that they are quite the reverse, that there could be a way of encouraging young people in particular to take up the habit. So far, that doesn't seem to be the case in the UK, but the evidence from the United States, where their use is even more widespread, points in that very direction. The most recent study of 40,000 young people revealed that e-cigarette use amongst high school pupils doubled between 2011 and 2012 from about 3.1% to 6.5%. Now, some members will have read the briefing from the anti-smoking group ASH before today's debate. ASH make the point that the ages covered by youth work services are crucial. 90% of all adult smokers begin while in their teens or earlier, and a tiny majority, minority of smokers start after the age of 24. In a separate survey published last week, ASH highlighted that the use of e-cigarettes in the adult population has increased fivefold over the past four years, with an even more dramatic rise in the number of people who have tried them. But vaping, unlike smoking, is unregulated. It's not covered by the ban on smoking in public places. And perhaps most worrying of all, there are no age restrictions on the sale of these products. In fact, vaping is now being advertised on the telly, in the cinemas, and through social media. Now, I can't speak for other members, but my main motivation in voting and supporting the ban on smoking in public places in Scotland was that it would help us denormalise smoking. We would no longer see people uh, smoking in our pubs, our cafes, uh, or most other workaday or social situations. We and our children would no longer see smoking as a normal activity. And I believe the ban has been very successful in doing exactly that. But I worry that we are about to undo some of that good work. The Advertising Standards Authority have just finished their consultation on the advertising of e-cigarettes, and I hope they treat them as they would any other cigarette. But there are steps we can take here in Scotland. The UK government, for example, has announced it intends to ban their sale to under-18s, and the Welsh Assembly have said they will restrict their use in enclosed public spaces. Here in Scotland, the Minister is undoubtedly making the right noises and seems to be indicating our intention to follow suit. But so far, announcements have been limited to considering the next steps. Ash are clear. They say, to minimise the risk of drawing the next generation into nicotine addiction, we also want an under-18 age, under age restriction on the sale of e-cigarettes in Scotland, as is already being planned for England and Wales. And we need restrictions on how these products are promoted. The Royal Pharmaceutical Society are equally strong. In order not to undermine recent advances in public health policy, e-cigarettes should be treated in exactly the same way as any other form of smoking, including the same age restrictions as applied to tobacco products and restrictions on their use in public spaces, advertising and displays. The danger signs are here, presiding officer, 
and we need to act quickly, as quickly as those promoting these products. But I also want to conclude on a positive note and with what I consider a real success story for young people in Scotland. Scotland. Quoting from Ash once more, from the high smoking prevalence of around 30% when surveys began in the mid-1990s, there has now been a reduction to around 3% for 13-year-olds and 13% for 15-year-olds. Amongst young adults aged 16 to 24, there is also a declining trend, with smoker numbers now at a record low of 22%. So past initiatives such as bans on tobacco advertising, smoke-free public places and raising the age for purchasing tobacco to 18 are working. Let's build on that progress rather than undermine it. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we now move to the closing speeches. I call on Liz Smith. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I continue the positive theme and just reiterate the Conservatives' support for the uh, Government motion and for the Labour Party's uh, amendment? Uh, I think this has been a good debate. Uh, we are very supportive of a national youth work strategy and the stated aims of raising the profile of the sector and building the workforce capacity, providing that pays very careful attention uh, to the views of those who are most involved. And I think that was a point that was made very strongly in the excellent briefing that we were provided with by YouthLink Scotland, where I think they uh, made us think very carefully about the role of a strategy and uh, the clarity of the objectives that must be contained within it. And just to pick up the interesting point that I thought Bob Doris uh, raised, that it is about building relationships rather than just about specific projects. And I, you're absolutely right, that's true. Uh, but as a result, that makes it even more difficult uh, because it's unmeasurable. Uh, but we have to be very careful when we are setting uh, the objectives for the strategy. And I share the concerns of Siobhan McNan and also of Ken McIntosh. We just need to do a little bit more uh, to focus on these objectives within the strategy. We've had uh, several uh, excellent presentations this afternoon uh, about uh, people uh, who have managed to uh, involve their uh, constituency uh, work as well as their own personal work, uh, Graham Pearson and Kezia Dugsdale, uh, Bob Doris, uh, Jamie Hepburn and George Adam have all spoken about the excellent work. We wouldn't survive without all these uh, volunteers, that's very clear. And so anything that is uh, promoting that I think has to be uh, very good. Could I just uh, turn attention to highlight two of the uh, principles which I think underpin uh, the Scottish Government's uh, strategy document. The first is about the wider issue of breaking down uh, some of the barriers. Uh, the, the, we were very conscious in Scottish education uh, about some of these barriers and the focus that needs to be uh, put upon that. And in this particular case, I think about integrating uh, youth work much more closely with the elements of uh, curriculum for excellence. And uh, the second issue, uh, which I'll come to in a minute, is about the notion, uh, Minister, that you mentioned of uh, preventative uh, spend both uh, laudable objectives. When it comes to breaking down barriers, the document outlines plans to strengthen the links between uh, volunteers, uh, school staff, uh, youth work practitioners, uh, something which I think has uh, particular uh, resonance for many of the teachers and the volunteers who are looking at the development of the senior phase of curriculum for excellence just now. And I think that's something that's important in that uh, wider context because as I see it, I think Scottish education and the development of youth in Scotland just now is at a very interesting stage, uh, and that's something that's been brought up uh, by uh, Ian Wood in his uh, consultations. Perhaps it's seen very much on employability skills, but I think that also has to be seen in the connection with a lot of the, the volunteering that goes on, because a lot of what is taught with, by volunteers uh, are some of the soft skills that can be so helpful uh, that, and they complement everything that is required uh, for, the, uh, in, well, for the labour market, let's be uh, honest about it. And the, the, the clear embodiment, I think, uh, of that is very much in the desire for uh, us to have greater flexibility within the institutions uh, of this country who are working with young people uh, because there is much, much better uh, interrelationship with them than perhaps there has ever been before. So I think that's uh, something that we have to pay some kind of cognizance to when it comes to uh, developing uh, the strategy. Because I think while there is that closer collaboration, uh, and it definitely commands a lot of support right across the, the Parliament, uh, it's, uh, to go back to the point that Youth uh, Link Scotland made, it's about ensuring that those on the ground uh, share in that idea uh, and that they have the... Uh, the commitment to that strategy uh, and also that they are aware of where the financing uh, and how the timetabling uh, will come into play because we, 
we, we've had some interesting debates in the uh, Joint Public Bodies Bill in this Parliament about the difficulties of having to integrate health and, and social care, and I think there will be some issues about the same thing in education and perhaps some of the youth work. Uh, could I just uh, turn to the issue of uh, preventative spend uh, policy-wise? That's uh, not a new idea, and it is laudable. I think this government has tried uh, hard to bring that uh, to the forefront of a lot of their uh, policy ideas. Um, but I think, as my colleague Mary Scanlon noted, there is evid evidence which suggests that uh, if we have a risk of disengaging uh, from youth work and from education, such services uh, you know, can increase uh, school exclusions and attendance. So I think what, what I would like to see when it comes to preventative spend is the hard and fast evidence about what works. And therefore, if we are going to spend a great deal of money on uh, developing youth work, I think it would be preferable if we could actually see the hard evidence where we know things uh, work. But, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, can I commend the Government for bringing forward this debate, and we are fully supportive of the strategy. Well Many thanks. Now call on Kezia Dugdale. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I agree with Liz Smith that it's been a very positive debate, it's been good natured and I think um, that we've all learnt something, whether it's the dangers are of uh, vaping or the fact that Liam MacArthur used to be a girl guide, um, we've all gone away with a little bit of, of knowledge from today. Can, can I recognise that Jim Sweeney and his colleagues from Youth League Scotland are actually in the public gallery and invite members to read his article this week in TFN? Third Force News, where he points to the fact that every £1 spent on youth work services saves 13. And I think from a number of uh, speakers this afternoon, we've learned a lot about uh, the requirement for more sustainable uh, funding options. I think there's a loud and clear message to the government benches that um, youth work organisations would very much like to be in a firmer financial footing, that their jobs would become considerably easier if that was the case. Um, many of the youth work organisations that uh, I work with would benefit uh, from that. Um, they don't necessarily all have uh, accountants either. It tends to be that there's one particular youth worker that's good at the books that gets the job of making sure the sums add up and that particular worker very much would much rather do the day job of doing the youth work rather than sitting in front of an Excel spreadsheet. So we could ease the job there with just a little bit more thought. Of course, it's not just all about financial saving, and we touched a little bit on this in the debate this afternoon. It's the educational journey that some young people go through um, whilst involved in, in youth work. And I mentioned earlier the work of the cross-party group. We've actually got two Princess Trust young ambassadors sitting on the uh, cross-party group for children and young people on a permanent basis, and they make a very valuable uh, contribution week in, week out. Uh, and both of those young people have had uh, expansive uh, experience of youth work services, and uh, both of them are now on their way to becoming youth workers themselves and I'm surprised uh, by just how many young people I've met who've had a really positive experience of youth work who then want to go on to be youth workers and to give back because they, they know um, what a transformational power it's had over their own lives and they want other people to benefit from that too. They see it very much as a career. It doesn't have to be a career for everybody though and I think a few people have also touched on some of the peer educating work that's done through youth work which is all about giving young people the skills into personal skills to teach what they to other young people on the strength that, that comes from that. Can I thank the Minister in particular for highlighting the work of LGBT Youth Scotland and although it would be possible to highlight a number of uh, individual groups who provide very targeted youth work support, I don't think we can underestimate just how important dedicated services for young LGBT people are, uh, particularly uh, to young people who feel very isolated when they're coming out, who are just desperate to meet more young people like them and that uh, LGBT Youth Scotland uh, provides in many ways uh, that sense of community that they need. For some young people it's a lifeline, uh, for other young people it's a place just to meet up and hang out and we've got to recognise the broad spectrum of services that go from that from crisis to the social aspect of just a few young people uh, coming into a room together and meeting and greeting. We also need to recognise uh, how often uh, youth work services are at the front line of some of the big social challenges that we face. And I spoke at length at the beginning about sexual health services, but I think it's also important to recognise the role that youth work plays around the drugs agenda. Uh, and I'm sure the Minister will be very aware uh, of the work that CREW do in Edinburgh CREW 2000 in terms of um, working with young people's attitudes towards drugs. And she might be aware at the weekend a number of uh, music festivals across Scotland, including Tea in the Park, uh, said uh, that they wouldn't be 
um, allowing legal highs to be sold to any of their festivals or concerts uh, th this summer. I think that's a very important move and one that we should welcome across the chamber. However, it doesn't um, avoid the fact that many young people buy legal highs online and, and just because they won't be sold at Tea in the Park doesn't mean they won't be taken at Tea in the Park. And we should recognise the role that youth work plays in helping young people to know the score, as we've so often talked about, uh, giving young people the skills to reduce the risk of drugs if they insist on taking them, making sure that they know things about not to mix with alcohol, know how much water to drink, to think about who they're buying from and the dangers associated with that. Youth work is absolutely at the front line uh, of that work and it's not just the only public health uh, agenda where it does such work. Uh, Ken McIntosh pointed to vaping as another example. It's not just about educational presiding officer. Youth work um, goes into health, it goes into justice, it goes into communities. And the Minister mentioned the Christie Commission in her opening uh, remarks about breaking down those silos. And I would uh, challenge her again to think about how we can ensure that every barrier to participation is broken down to help youth work fulfil its potential. And it's not even just about breaking down barriers, as George Adam pointed to. It's trying to find mechanisms where other uh, youth work organisations can collaborate together to widen the, the types of work that they do. Yes, to reduce costs in some regards, but to be more imaginative and varied in the services that, that they provide. President officer, I think Bob Doris nailed it when he said that youth work isn't about activities, it's about relationships. And I can't think of any youth worker I know in the country who would disagree with that statement. Uh, and the value of those relationships uh, is absolutely critical. In conclusion, President Officer, uh, the Minister knows that I have a very strong interest in care leavers and the care leaving agenda. Uh, I think we did some really good work together around the Children and Young People Bill and there's a lot more that we could do around that uh, agenda. So I called Who Care Scotland this morning to ask them what they thought of the youth work uh, strategy and whether they had anything that they wanted to contribute. Uh, and they had a lot of very strong and positive words to offer the Minister with regards to the youth work strategy. In fact, they wished that many other government services had the same principles at their heart, uh, the principles of partnership of collaboration, of co-design and co-production. Uh, they believed that if social work worked in the same way, if education departments worked in the same way, if the police worked in the same way, we would all be better off. So nothing but good words from Who Cares Scotland uh, in that regard. So just finally, President Officer, can I once again uh, congratulate all, all the staff involved in youth work organisations and all the volunteers who they are uh, very, very much reliant on uh, week in, week out. Uh, thank the Minister for the opportunity to debate these issues and look forward to her remarks in closing, or indeed the Minister's. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure he will address some of the points we've made about um, long-term sustainable funding in great depth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now call on the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you have until 3.40, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I say at the outset that this has been a, a debate of reasonable and sometimes in this chamber remarkable consensus. Um, and we will, of course, accept the amendment that's coming from the Labour Party. This is a, a debate that MSPs particularly enjoy, an opportunity to blend local and national, uh, to talk about their own constituencies and their own concerns as well as national concerns they have. So uh, in starting, presiding officer, I will mention my own constituency of Argyll and Butte and the HELP project in Dunoon, which is a project with whom I uh, recently sponsored a jobs fair, which do a great deal of work with young people moving from uh, uh, school or other activities to employment. And I also want to echo what Kezia Dugdale said and welcome Jim Sweeney and his colleagues to the debate and to hear what I'm sure that even they will realise is an unusually united chamber this afternoon and a chamber of positivity about the work that they do. As Mary Scanlon has pointed out, this is not what we do every day or every afternoon, but it is good that we do it sometimes. Let me, for a moment or two, just talk about some of the contributions to the debate before I, I, I widened out into the key issues, including funding. George Adam was absolutely right to say that what we're talking about this afternoon is making a difference to lives and communities. That is exactly what we're engaged in. And there is a key role for volunteering and for community support. But there is also a key role for young people themselves. And the strategy is focused on how young people lead the process of making a difference to their own lives and communities. Uh, I'm not a patron of any youth organisation. I wasn't in either the Scouts or the BBs, and I haven't even heard Labour talk this afternoon about the Woodcraft folk, which I also wasn't in. But I was active in a number of church groups when I was young. And one of the things that we need to recognise is there is a great variety in provision still, and a great many different ways in which youth work under, is undertaken. And uh, we need to recognise and celebrate that. Bob Doris indicated how that variety can work in informal and formal settings. This is a very rich landscape and a very rich tapestry. 
And it's important to recognize that there is no single uh, piece of work or help, piece of help that would make all the difference. There has to be a strategy that is varied, that is broad reaching, but it also has to have, as this strategy does have, an implementation uh, uh, plan attached. And this is about individuals as well as organizations, as Graham Pearson's very touching story showed. This is about what individuals want to do and feel they can do to make a difference. And therefore, it's not just about resources. I will uh, address the resources question that Siobhan McMahon raised in a minute. I will talk about the way in which this government is bringing forward resources and will continue to do so. Resources are always important, but the strategy is about how we work together. The implementation plan is clear on how we do that, but we need new ideas as well. And therefore, to go back to Bob Doris's speech, the, his idea about Erasmus funding is an interesting thought which we can take further. It's also not about what we can't do. And sometimes in Scotland, when we start talking about money, we end up talking about the things that we don't feel we can do. This is about what we can do. And it's about finding the imaginative ways of doing it. And Kezir Dugdale was right to link that to the key issues in individual lives, legal or illegal highs, sexual health, alcohol, tobacco. And it's right for Mr. McIntosh to raise vaping. I'm quite sure the health ministers will bring forward their plans and will have noted Mr. McIntosh's contribution. But it illustrates, as other speakers have illustrated this afternoon, the fact that this is about a, ho the, a holistic view into individuals, and it is about how individuals learn and change. And the final point I would then make about the speeches relates to something that Liz Smith said. Uh, she linked to what we're talking about this afternoon to Wood, to Wood Report, and then to others have linked it to CFE. This youth strategy does not stand on its own. It integrates with all other aspects of education and indeed with the personal learner journeys that this government has been so keen to support in every part of its legislation and its activities in education. Let me, presiding officer, turn now to funding. The government not only values the significant role that youth worker agencies and organisations play, but has indicated that with the funding support. Over the years 2013 to 2015, Children's Rights and Wellbeing Division have and are providing around £6.9 million directly to national voluntary youth work and youth citizenship organisations through the Third Sector Early Intervention Fund, Strategic Partnership Funding, the National Voluntary Organisation Support Fund and Programme Grants. And since the inception of Cashback for Communities, we've invested or committed over £70 million in projects and facilities for young people and the communities they live in. And as Aileen Campbell mentioned in her opening remarks, we announced a further 2.1 million awarded to YouthLink Scotland for the Cashback programme. Cashback has been an extraordinarily successful programme in helping the ambitions of this country and this government. And we see the results through programmes such as the Green Team project in East Lothian. The project, that project, which is funded by Cashback, identifies young people from areas of multiple deprivation who are at risk of becoming involved in antisocial behaviour or dependency on drugs and alcohol. Just the points that Kezia Dugdale was raising in terms of the learning experience about avoiding as well as being involved in other things. And the project provides opportunities for young people to take part in community-based environmental volunteering, developing new skills and outdoor activities. That's just one example of how cashback flows into the system and sustains and now is continuing to sustain an enormous variety of activity. And it's underpinned by the type of regular funding from government which makes a difference. Now, could there be more? Of course, there could always be more. There's no organization in Scotland that doesn't say there should be more. And of course, over a period of time, there are ways in which that can sometimes be found. But we are committed to supporting national youth work agencies and organizations and committed to supporting projects and continue to work with strategic funding partnerships, big, uh, just one moment, big and Youth Link Scotland to support funded organisations to measure, and this was a, a point, key point this afternoon, to measure and demonstrate the outcomes from the grants provided, which allows us to build on best practice. Please take Ian it away. Grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Returning to the point I raised with the Minister earlier on, I think the complaint from the Scout Group when I spoke to them wasn't that there was a lack of funding. It was what they were able to do with the funding that was available. So they could buy any number of tents, of which they had plenty, but they couldn't support um, sending uh, members of the troop away to events in the Central Belt or indeed um, further afield. 
Cabinet Secretary. And, and I think we are still sometimes guilty, and organisations are still some, sometimes guilty of over-prescription. If I go back to the start of what I said, if we are encouraging young people to, to lead their own activities and essentially to be the guide of their own activities, they should also be saying what is most useful in the funding. And we should learn from that experience. And I have a particular sympathy uh, with what Mr McArthur said in terms of travel to the central belt. That is an issue, issue for all of us who represent rural and island constituencies. Now, there are synergies across government in these matters. Uh, we are bringing together uh, issues such as the Wood Report, the initial Wood Report, and also other activities, including the new uh, Statement of Ambition in Adult Learning, which will be launched on the 21st of May, and which sees lifelong learning, uh, adult learning as being lifelong, life-wide, and life-centred, just as Curriculum for Excellence is personalised, deep, linked, and progressive. So all the initiatives that this government takes are joined together in the view that learning is not something we do once. We just want to be the country. This, we do want the country to be the best place to grow up, but we also want Scotland to be the best place in which you go on learning, and you learn in a variety of different ways, in a variety of different places, in a variety of different contexts, and you always learn, no matter where you are. Uh, presiding officer, this afternoon has been a unifying event. I think it has shown that this chamber at its best can come together and can look very, very carefully of what is best for Scotland. That is what we've done this afternoon, and by taking forward the strategy, which I hope will be endorsed unanimously this afternoon, uh, with the additional statement and volunteering from the amendment, then we are doing something that will help you, you young people in Scotland. What will help them even more if we go on, and we will go on, funding them and supporting them to ensure that the strategy becomes reality. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the National Youth Work Strategy, our ambitions for improving the life chances of young people in Scotland. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 9916 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on wildlife crime eradicating raptor persecution from Scotland. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And if you're ready, uh, Minister, I would now call on Minister Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 10 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the motion in my name. Uh, today's debate offers Parliament the opportunity to unite in condemnation of all forms of raptor persecution and to show our resolve to eradicate it from Scotland. I hope I speak for us all when I convey my own feelings of anger, revulsion and utter frustration that these and other wildlife crimes persist in Scotland in the 21st century. I hope that today we send the clearest possible message to those involved that what they are doing has no place in Scotland and they should expect to be pursued with the full weight of the law. Persecution of raptors in Scotland must stop. It is cruel, it's barbaric, it's outdated. It's selfish and it's dangerous. It threatens the survival of some of our rarest wildlife and poisons, uh, risk livestock, domestic pets and conceivably even children too. Wildlife crime stains Scotland's reputation as a country that values and respects its nature and wildlife. We are, after all, the land of John Muir. And through its impact on wildlife tourism and Scotland's brand, wildlife crime threatens our economic prosperity. It's certainly against the law, but it's also true that the vast majority of Scots, both in rural and urban Scotland, detest the practice and have contempt for those who carry it out. I acknowledge the sincere views of opposition members, and in the spirit of unity, we will be supporting the Labour amendment today. I hope members will appreciate that we will need to consider how best to undertake such a review and that we do not want to deflect effort from current measures and reviews that are underway. I wish to recap briefly on some of the steps the Scottish Government has taken so far since 2007. In 2007, in this Parliament's first debate on wildlife crime, following the poisoning of a golden eagle near Peebles, the debate was opened by the then Solicitor General and now Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland QC, who gave a strong signal when he said, it's essential for the economic health and successful biodiversity of our nation that we have protected thriving wildlife. Wildlife is an inheritance to be cherished and the criminal law has an important part to play in its protection. In 2008, a review of how we tackled wildlife crime led to the Natural Justice Report and setting up of a new and strengthened partnership for action against wildlife crime in Scotland, for which I am honoured to chair. The Wildlife and Natural Environment Act 2011 strengthened our existing wildlife legislation and introduced a new concept of vicarious liability into the protection of wildlife, including birds of prey. The Wayne Act, as it's known, also triggered the first ever annual report on wildlife crime to be laid before the Parliament last year. 
Law enforcement agencies have strengthened their resourcing of wildlife crime prosecutions with a dedicated Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service, Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit, with uh, experienced fiscals who are providing consistency and focus to a complex and diverse area of law. The new Police Scotland structure has maintained and, we believe, improved the Wildlife Crime Officer Network. It has added new central coordination roles, as well as more senior officer oversight to ensure consistent professional standards of investigation of wildlife crime. We now have internationally recognised and outstanding support services for law enforcement, and we have committed a further two years of funding to the National Wildlife Crime Unit, based in West Lothian. I certainly will. I'm very grateful to the Minister and I, I'm particularly grateful for the, the, the strength of the words he's had to say uh, today. In relation to Police Scotland, you'll be aware of concerns that when approached in relation to incidents in uh, South Lanarkshire, um, it was suggested that Police Scotland's response was this was not a police matter. Um, is that something he's been able to invest, investigate and get to the bottom of? I, I, in, in respect Minister. to the member's uh, point, I have had a, a discussion with uh, officials about this, and we do believe that the proper procedures were followed, but I'm happy to, to deal with that matter uh, further later. Um, Science and Advice uh, for Scottish Agriculture, or SASA as most of us know it, have a state-of-the-art facility and usually respected team who carry out post-mortems and undertake toxicology testing in suspected poison wildlife cases. SASA provide undisputed data on the extent of the abuse of pesticides and other poisons to kill wildlife in Scotland. Evidential trails are often hard to develop, and we are fortunate that SASA is also home to the development of a world-leading wildlife DNA forensic lab, providing services and advanced forensic techniques for wildlife crime investigators here in Scotland and indeed around the world. We believe robust laws are in place, and we have professional and determined investigators. Yet we, know, we do, need, do know rather, uh, more needs to be done, as recent events demonstrate so clearly. Last year, given early signs of criminals changing their modus operandi, I announced three new measures in response to continued evidence of other raptor persecution cases. Firstly, Professor Mark Pousty from Strathclyde University has agreed to lead the review of wildlife crime penalties. We need to be assured that penalties available to courts are a sufficient deterrent, amid concerns they are insufficient. Professor Pousty will report in December. Second, I also announced Scottish Natural Heritage uh, are initiating a, charged them with initiating a measure to restrict the use of general licences in areas where there is good reason to believe that wildlife crimes may be taking place. The general licence in practice has been a very light touch uh, piece of regulation. It allows a user to shoot or trap certain species of birds, such as crows, without any reference to or control by SNH. The general licence is based on trust. We know it can be used as a cover for committing wildlife crimes and I think it would be utterly wrong to allow its continued use in circumstances where, on the balance of probabilities, SNH judge wildlife crime is taking place. SNH have introduced an enabling paragraph into the general licence and will soon bring forward a scheme to allow for any restriction to be implemented. In the final measure I announced, I recognise that very often it appears that those who kill raptors do so in a determined and organised fashion, taking advantage of operating in remote areas, often at night, with little chance of being spotted by witnesses. Modern policing does have tools to address this, and while we can't interfere in police operational matters, as I'm sure members will agree, I'm very grateful to have the clear and explicit support from the Lord Advocate and from senior police officers in encouraging the police to use all investigative techniques at their disposal, including video surveillance, where appropriate. And if you could keep it brief, please. Christine Graham. I shall definitely keep it brief. I just want to say a concern that's been raised with me is, is to have specialised wildlife policing throughout Scotland and that they are pretty thin on the ground. Do you share these concerns and could you intimate these to Police Scotland if you do? Minister. It's uh, an important issue that Christine Graham raises. I certainly uh, have heard similar concerns expressed to me. What I would say is we've expanded the number of wildlife crime trained officers from 8 to 14 and obviously we're undertaking a consultation on investigatory powers for SSPCA which I'm, I will refer to later in my closing, closing remarks. I would like to say a few words now about the recent and appalling events that have prompted this debate today. The Chamber will appreciate I can't go into any details that run the risk, the remotest risk of prejudicing uh, criminal investigations or prosecutions. The poisoning incident in Rosshire has seen the loss of 16 red kites and six buzzards. This is a horrendous loss. The death of so many birds in a single incident is very likely to have a significant impact on the population in an area where huge efforts have been made to reintroduce them. Many of these kites were established breeding birds that would have contributed to the population around the Black Isle, and this is reflected in the very well community of con condemnation of the incident by all local stakeholders and a joint reward of £26,000. 
However, this incident is only part of the story. Members may be aware that the red kite population in this area was reintroduced at the same time as a similar number of red kites were released in the Chilterns in England. Now, though, there are roughly six times as many birds there as in the north of Scotland. While there may be other factors, and I accept that, the difference is most likely, if not entirely, due to illegal killing here in Scotland. I regret uh, if toxicology confirms suspected poisonings, we've probably now passed a shameful landmark, the recording of 100 illegally killed red kites in northern Scotland since 1989. We've also, of course, had reports of other separate incidents involving peregrine falcons in Stirlingshire and Lanarkshire, and most recently a missing satellite tagged sea eagle in Aberdeenshire, the first chick to be born in the recently reintroduced sea eagles uh, to the east coast, something we all celebrated last year. Frustratingly, we may never know what happened to that eagle, but it is perhaps highly significant that the bird and its transmitter have disappeared in an area where other raptors have disappeared in suspicious circumstances. In this context, I can now understand why some are calling for further legislation now. However, while we, that may prove to be the end game in due course, and frustrating as the current situation is, I want to sign a note of parliamentary caution, and I'll explain why. The three measures that I have mentioned earlier have not been fully implemented and take effect. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, uh, Mr McGregor. As stated earlier, we're yet to see the effect of restricting the use of general licences or of any increase in penalties. Similarly, while proceedings have commenced in the first vicarious liability case in Stranraer Sheriff Court, we have not yet seen what impact such a case will have on the actions of some owners and managers in the areas where these problems occur. However, let me be absolutely clear, the Scottish Government is determined to stamp out this deeply unpleasant and pernicious criminal behaviour if and when we judge it necessary, I am committed to taking further action. If that involves licensing certain types of businesses, then we will do so. While I am not committed to licensing of this kind, it is not unreasonable we undertake a death study of measures deployed elsewhere, particularly in the EU, and I will ask officials to advise on next steps. All of those who might be affected by tougher regulation should take note that it is they who are unnecessarily bringing a threat down on their whole sector. They must hear that these crimes have gone much too far and that Parliament's patience is rapidly running out. In my closing speech, I'll address the current important consultation on SSPCA investigatory powers and I'll cover the wider work of Paul Scotland. I'll also address what additional steps we propose to remove toxic substances from our countryside. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, we are implementing measures that I believe will have an impact, but our patience in that of Parliament is not infinite. This government, and I believe this parliament, are determined to rid Scotland of a blight on her reputation. I hope we'll stand together for Scotland's wildlife, and I look forward to hearing members' contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I call Claire Baker, can I say I have a little bit of time in hand at this stage of the proceedings for interventions? I call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 9916.3. Seven minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin by commending the Minister for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Um, I have tried to be selected for topicals over the last few weeks, so I'm glad the Minister has recognised the significance of the situation and used parliamentary time to debate this subject. This is clearly an emotive subject um, that has gathered a significant amount of attention from organisations and the wider public. I am pleased that we have today the opportunity to discuss wildlife crime and how we can work together to ensure we do not continue to be faced with the unacceptable deaths of our iconic birds, and I fully support the Minister's opening comments in his speech. The reaction to the latest raptor deaths, from the demonstration in Inverness to the donations that were received by RSPB, should make everyone in the Chamber pause and reflect on the impact these deaths are having, not just on our wildlife, but also on the image of Scotland and the value that we place on our environment. Nature-based tourism is worth some £1.4 billion a year to our economy, and SNH said the recent deaths detract from that value and diminish Scotland's appeal as a major wildlife tourism destination. And it is vulnerable raptors that are often being targeted, so while overall numbers might be small, the impact on that population can be significant. Um, I do appreciate this is a very difficult crime to tackle, the remote locations, the length of time it can take for the crime to be detected, the lack of witnesses. We have recently passed legislation and the government have announced some welcome additional measures. But the recent cases in the lack of prosecution, December 13, um, the poisoning of a golden eagle, February 2014, the poisoning of a peregrine falcon, April 2014, the killing of a peregrine falcon, display a crime which is evading the law. If we can identify areas of legislation that can be strengthened or reviewed, we must give serious consideration to take that option forward. 
We must also look critically at the resources that are being deployed, and we, we must challenge this culture where it is acceptable. I am confident that everyone in the Chamber today believes that these abhorrent deaths of the 22 raptors last month are unacceptable and that the perpetrators should be found and prosecuted. But again and again we come back to the difficulty of detection and evidence gathering and I believe there is more can be done in these areas. I am pleased that the Government are now consulting on the greater powers for SSPCA officers. This consultation was due last year, and in light of delays, and the Minister might be able to say more, I know he was going to speak about this in his closing, about the reason for why we are having such a long consultation process, which will run from March through to September, and when he believes any extra powers will be granted to the SSPCA. Our proposal to increase penalties is also very welcome, and they must be fixed at a level that will provide a strong deterrent. However, deterrence will only work if there is a realistic prospect of prosecution. That is why the SSPCA consultation is so important. As highlighted in RSPB's, RSPB's briefing, the expertise, specialist equipment and facilities of the SSPCA will benefit the work of the police. We need to ensure that the powers granted to inspectors are sufficient enough to contribute towards securing convictions. Um, I have previously raised concerns over the role of wildlife crime officers within Police Scotland. In speaking to people who work in this area, there are concerns that this is often a part-time role or that the officer is frequently moved around and changed. There is also an issue about commitment and expertise. The effectiveness of the role is dependent on the commitment and knowledge of that officer. There is a need for officers to gain the trust of the community, to know the community well, to be able to gather intelligence and to work in partnerships with others. Can the Minister say what discussions he's had with Police Scotland over operational matters on wildlife crime? And this is the issue that um, Christine Graham raised earlier in the debate. Um, whilst our amendment today acknowledges the work that the Government is taking on SSPC and wildlife crime penalties, it does also call for further action. And I recognise that the Government do um, recognise this and are given a commitment that if that action needs to be taken, they will do so. I appreciate it is not long since the 2011 passing of the Wayne Act, but last year there was a rise in confirmed raptor poisonings, and this year's incidents, combined with a lack of convictions, which would only, you would hope this, you know, it has a danger that encourages others that it's an acceptable crime to carry out, and it's a crime that they're likely to get away with. Um, this uh, does suggest that we, there's a, the need for us to go back to the legislation to scrutinise its measures and consider additional action. There's also a belief that the detected crimes are perhaps not the complete picture. There will be undetected crime and unreported crime, so the figures could be more significant. When the Act was passed, it was an indication that the Government would be prepared to go back and look at other options if this wasn't successful. Whilst the introduction of vicarious liability was welcomed, and there is a belief that it initially led to a reduction in poisonings, it has not yet been tested in a Scottish court, uh, notwithstanding the current case at um, uh, um, Stranraer. So. The lack of convictions for wildlife crimes also seem to indicate that it is failing to work as a vehicle for holding those responsible to account. That is why in our amendment we propose the Government conduct a study of wildlife legislation from out with Scotland, particularly of licensing and game bird legislation in other countries. And I am very pleased the Government has indicated, the Minister has indicated that he will support our amendment. And for example, the RSP briefing highlights that Scotland lacks any regulation of game shooting and my colleague Peter, Peter, Peter Peacock brought forward amendments in this area um, to the bill at stage three. But we cannot eradicate this type of crime without changing the culture. Um, it seems to come from a place where there is a single focus on what that one sector believes suits their needs regardless of the consequences on other interests. This places a huge responsibility on land managers. And I fully accept that it will be a small minority who are involved in any kind of criminal activity and fully acknowledge the contribution that NFU Scotland and Scottish Land and Estates have made to the reward fund that was established by RSPB. But there are still elements of land management who think this activity is acceptable, maybe even necessary, and we must all work together to challenge and change that culture. And this challenge must come not just from politicians and conservationists, but from land managers themselves. It is a small minority, but by perpetuating these acts, the subsequent negative press and public reaction impacts on all landowners across Scotland and um, land users, their businesses and tourism as a whole. Uh, briefly. To the member. Would you accept that at this point in time, uh, there is not one shred of evidence that links the appalling loss, losses in Rothschild to land management or land ownership? Clare Baker. 
Well, that's obviously an ongoing um, police investigation. But I think the Minister referred to we need to look at the science and look at where bird population has been affected. And I think there's... I think we need to be honest that there is people involved in land management who think this practice is acceptable. Um, and it's, I accept fully that it's a minority, but to change that culture and make clear that it's unacceptable. I, mean, I spoke to Scotch Land and Estates last week, um, and I recognise the work that they are doing to try and address this. But as I will go on to say, there are some people who perhaps aren't involved in any of these structures or involved in any of the big organisations. We need to make sure we reach those people. Um, as well as having robust legislation and an effective wildlife crime unit, we do need to make sure we properly resource education and training opportunities. As I say, not every land owner or manager is a member of a formal organisation, and we need to make sure that they still have the opportunity to interrogate their practice and make sure that they are compliant with the law. And I look back at the passage of the Wayne Act for this debate, and Peter Peacock closed his contribution by saying, um, the issue has not gone away, it will come back. And we should all be hugely disappointed that these words have come to pass. We must continue to strive to create a culture where raptor persecution is unacceptable and the practice won't be tolerated by anyone who has an interest in our countryside and our wildlife. And we must be prepared to take measures to make sure that happens. Um, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Jamie McGregor. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate, and I thank those organisations who have provided briefings. And I want to begin by emphasising that the Scottish Conservatives, along with other parties across the Chamber, condemn without hesitation the recent, recent poisoning incident in Rochester, as we would condemn any illegal poisoning of any animal or bird. It's important that we are united in sending out this very strong message. Now, the Scottish Conservatives are clear that there is enough legislation in place to allow the police to investigate wildlife crime, catch those responsible, and to bring them to justice. The proper enforcement of this legislation is vital. The rule of law must be upheld, and this is what we must focus on. We support Police Scotland in their efforts to investigate and find those responsible for the Rochester incident. But there has been much side briefing by many organisations, which is not necessarily a good thing, as it can cloud a straightforward issue. There are many rumours now circulating amongst the local inhabitants in Rochester of how this disaster may have come about. I am reliably told that red kites are hand-fed in the area at the Tolly feed station on the Bran Estate. It has been muted that maybe there might have been some contamination in what they were fed to cause such a sudden mass death. I repeat, this is only rumour and speculation by an imagined minister that the first thing anyone investigating such an incident of this kind would check out would be the food source for possible contamination. And I asked the minister to confirm that this was done in the early stages of the investigation. Police Scotland should have the adequate resources to allow it to investigate all wildlife crime in the appropriate way. So is there any reason why the public still does not know what type of poisoning these birds died from? An answer to that would surely establish possible sources, but it seems we are all in the dark on this, unless the Minister can now enlighten us. We all well, I will, yes, of course. Minister? I'm grateful to the, the member taking an intervention. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for pointing out that there are very sound reasons in terms of the, the process of this particular investigation, why details of, of what has been used and how the investigation and proceedings have not been revealed. I, so, therefore, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot enlighten him further on the detail, although I do know some of it. And could I also urge Well, I'm sorry you can't, Minister. Jamie uh, McGregor. I, I'm sure the reasons are sound, but we, we would like to know what they are. Um, we, we, we also support the good work of the Partnership Against Wildlife Crime and congratulate the participants, all of them. A partnership approach is, ne approach is necessary to resolve all types of wildlife crime. We too recognise the very significant economic importance of wildlife and ornithological tourism to the Scottish economy, which should cover all birds which ornithologists come to see, from songbirds to the golden eagle. And I warmly welcome the SGAs that's the Scottish Gamekeepers Association's new conservation project, the Year of the Wader, which aims to help halt the very alarming decline of wading bird species such as the curlew, the lapwing, and the golden plover. As a farmer for a long time, 
I can remember the time when these birds were very plentiful in large flocks at certain times of year in the highlands. But now, in most places, they have become scarce. And we must find out the reasons for this. Um, I want to commend the Scottish Gamekeepers Association briefing for today's debate, which calls on the Scottish Government to seek to tackle some of the possible causes of wildlife crime at its root, and to act to ensure people understand they do have genuine legal alternatives to taking the law into their own hands when they are faced with conflicts which may affect their livelihoods. The SGA have repeated their call for proper guidance to be published in relation to a functional, science-based licensing system for businesses which might be affected by the impact of raptor species, and I asked the Minister to respond to this in his closing speech. The motion mentions sea eagles, and the impact of sea eagles on crofters' and farmers' livelihoods is another genuine issue of concern which has been widely published lately, and one that I've spoken out now for a number of years. It was discussed at a recent meeting of our cross-party group on crofting, which I chair, and I welcome the NFUS's recently published Sea Eagle Action Plan and look forward to ministers responding positively. I'm also very clear that government agencies in future must do more in terms of environmental impact studies before reintroductions of raptors or predators in order that damage to livestock and our indigenous wild bird populations, which is already there, is, is minimised. In terms of Labour's amendment, we're not convinced. Uh, that we think there's enough, uh, we think there's enough legislation already, but we won't be voting against the motion. In, con well, in conclusion, presiding officer, today's debate is useful as this Parliament sends out a unified message that we condemn illegal raptor persecution and all wildlife crime. But in this particular instance, it is important that we rapidly find out if this poisoning of this huge number of hand-fed red kites was in fact a crime and not an awful accident. We look to the government and its agencies to enforce the legislation that exists to bring those responsible to justice and to work constructively with all stakeholders to tackle some of the underlying reasons why some people say uh, they may commit wildlife crime. The minister says he is growing impatient uh, and, and proposes further legislation. But may I suggest that wildlife crime is being perpetrated by a very few individuals rather than any section of the Scottish countryside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now open up the debate. Speeches at this stage of the debate of up to five minutes, including uh, interventions. And can I also urge caution if any of these matters are sub judice? Rob Gibson to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to welcome uh, Scottish Land and Estates uh, briefing which states that uh, they attempt to keep a record of all recorded confirmed raptor incidents, but believe there is only information on just over half of these officially confirmed incidents in the public domain. Very few of these raptor investigations lead to charges being brought, let alone convictions, they say. This makes it difficult for anyone to draw reasonable and informed conclusions, but it's likely that there are a wide range of causes, including the protection of game, sheep, poultry, racing pigeons and recreational disturbance. That points at land managers to a great extent, but not entirely. It seems that the 19th century culture of kill all predators to game and livestock has not passed into history, more's the pity. The reason for the bird poisonings used to be uh, better understood in today's uh, land management uh, it needs to be much better understood in today's land management climate. Motives for grouse moor protection are adduced by the RSPB. What motives would prompt poisonings on farmland and forest properties, I ask? Can ministers analyse uh, motions, uh, motives uh, from conviction secured? That's very difficult. Few of these are compared to the bird deaths in the statistics, as we know. And that's why I think that the list of uh, bird deaths ought to be uh, combined with a map of the existing uh, estates and farms which are in the area where the carcasses are found. Not in order to blame people there, but to see whether people other than members of the NFUS and Scottish land and estates are in fact 
uh, perhaps in the firing line, as the birds have been, the birds that have been shot, poisoned, trapped, disturbed, nest destroyed, which all suggest that land management is at the root of this problem in particular. With the 2012 surveys of 52 breeding pairs of red kites in the Black Isle, we should not forget that there is a history of the destruction of 166 red kites between 1999 and 2006 in the Black Isle. So, therefore, there is a pattern of behaviour which we need to see on paper, on maps, to find out just exactly where these birds have been picked up and in what detail they have come. But I am very disappointed in those who suggest that uh, tourists will be put off from coming to our uh, beautiful countryside because of the current news. Really, tourism is uh, something which is on the rise. It is strong. And in fact, I have to say that weather plays a far bigger part in tourist decisions about where they're going to go than anything else. And I think we should take that into account. I do have far greater concerns over the ill-informed, the malcontents in our communities, perhaps on farms, forests and estates, who practice or condone these poisonings. And someone somewhere knows the culprits. This wall of silence must be broken down. Proof of intent is essential. Uh, an amnesty for chemicals begs the question about cross-compliance and good practice. Vicarious liability uh, you know, has yet to be applied, and perhaps once we've seen a case like that, we'll know whether it goes far enough in terms of the law. However, biodiversity and support for its application through the SRDP need to be appropriate and, will be pu and well publicised and leave land managers and users in no doubt about their duties in response to uh, raptors. While sheep farmers and crofters claim that sea eagles predate their flocks, financial compensation is required and should be based on proof that such uh, attacks have been happening and needs to have uh, a much more credible evidence base than has been provided so far. Again, uh, the default position in our countryside and communities should be do no harm, live and let live. But a clearer picture is needed across Scotland for MSPs to be sure that a culture change is truly embedded in the respect for raptors and their place in our ecosystem. Could you draw to a close, please? I support the government motion. Many thanks. I call Elaine Murray to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was uh, very privileged back in 2001 to be asked by the Environment Minister of the time, Rona Brankin, to stand in for her uh, when the first cohort of red kites was reintroduced into the Galloway Forest. It really was an extremely exciting uh, event to see these beautiful birds at, at close quarters and see them uh, gain their liberty. Uh, they'd come from up north, some, some from, from uh, colonies in England. But I know there was quite a lot of anxiety at the time as, because of the history of persecution of these uh, beautiful uh, birds that they might not thrive and survive and that they might become victims of the sort of persecution we're hearing about. Now, I visited the Red Kite, Kite Trail in Galloway on Good Friday this year on a, a beautiful sunny day. And, and I, we could, I could observe pairs of kites riding the thermals above the roads in several locations. Uh, we stopped actually outside Bellamac Farm near Lauriston just after two o'clock when the, the kites are fed uh, and observed dozens of red kites circling and swooping to pick up food. I think it really was one of the most spectacular wildlife sites I've ever witnessed. And in, uh, I suppose in comment on Mr McGregor's uh, point, from what I could see of the feeding at that location, I think it would be very doubtful that any, any sort of contamination would be likely to take place. It, it seemed to be extremely well organised. A report by the RSPB in 2010 and estimated that at that time the Red Kite Trail in Galloway had brought £21 million in new sped into the area at a period of six years. And certainly on the occasion when I observed the kites feeding from the side of the road, uh, the viewing gallery on the farm was absolutely packed with bird watchers. And it's, the Kite Trail clearly is an established tourist attraction in the area now. And I think the visit really drove home to me the shocking nature of the recent poison, poisonings uh, in the Highlands, 16 red kites and six 
buzzards. We've discussed and debated the issue of wildlife crime in this Parliament on many occasions, and it is so disappointing that this illegal and disgraceful activity is still going on. When the Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill was passing through Parliament in the last session in 2010-11, my colleague Peter Peacock, as uh, uh, Claire Baker has said, suggested that perhaps a licensing scheme could be introduced for sporting estates, uh, uh, where, and that would actually mean that those estates where raptor pers persecution persisted could actually lose their licence and the source of their income. Uh, it wasn't felt that that was appropriate at the time. And also, as far as I recall, at that time, Scottish land and estates were actually progressing in some form of voluntary code. I'm not quite sure how that has progressed since then. The Environment Minister, Rosanna Cunningham, brought in clauses providing for vicarious liability, which would enable landowners to be pro uh, prosecuted for poisoning on their estates. Uh, and Labour fully supported that measure and, and was happy to do so. Uh, but we've always believed that actually if it doesn't work, and maybe the jury is out as to whether it works so far, but we should actually reconsider whether other measures were necessary. And one of the measures I promoted at the time of the bill was the extension of the powers of the SSPCA to enable officers to retrieve evidence relating to wildlife crime. The Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act had conferred powers to SSPCA officers to search and, uh, and enter homes to retrie retrieve evidence relating to animal cruelty, and these powers were deployed, for example, in 2011 when the first conviction for dog fighting was skewed under that act uh, and at the, at the, that's a possible a parallel in terms of powers. At the time the Wayne Bill was under consideration it was felt that there hadn't been enough consultation on these proposals to go, uh, for them to be taken forward during that bill. But I did ask the Scottish Government back in 2012 whether it was going to be giving uh, uh, consideration to an extension of the SSB uh, SSBCA's powers uh, and what, originally that was supposed to be launched in the first half of 2012 didn't happen, I asked again in 2013 and at that point I think it was supposed to be coming out in 2013 so it is a wee bit disappointing that the consultation hasn't appeared until the end of March this year but I am glad it's underway uh, and I look forward to its responses uh, I think this, this issue really does need to be uh, tackled urgently. I think a lot of us are in, in agreement on that because it is, as you have said, Minister, a stain on Scotland that, this, that we cannot respect, seem to respect our wildlife. Uh, and when you see these beautiful animals uh, close, as I did recently in Galloway, you, it, it really is such a privilege. Uh, I totally condemn anybody who gets, takes part in, in poisoning and persecution of these creatures. We should value them. We should treasure them. Uh, they're becoming part of our heritage. They're back in our countryside again, and it's tremendous to see them. Thank you very much. And I now call Graham Day to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, when the Minister appeared in front of the Rural Affairs Committee back in November of last year, he was able to report a downturn in incidents of recorded raptor poisoning, noting the figures had improved from 30 in 2009 to 3 in 2012. Interestingly, however, he added, uh, it goes out saying we cannot afford to be complacent. How prophetic those comments have proven to be. For hostilities, it seems, have been resumed in big style. 2013 saw a doubling of the number to six, and this year has been even more depressing. And, of course, other criminal non-poisoning recorded incidents involving raptors have been on the increase as well, going up from 10 in 2012 to 17 last year. And ironically, this comes against the backdrop of a marked increase in police resources being deployed across Scotland for the purposes of tackling wildlife crime. And it's worth noting that in an area like Angus, which sadly is a hotspot, those dedicated resources are further supplemented by the community of police officers who are operating in rural parts, assisting the work of the designated wildlife crime officer, PC Boyer Wilkie. As we all, I think, recognise, however, by its nature, getting on top of an issue such as raptor poisoning is hugely challenging. The Scottish Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, both want penalties for such offences to be toughened up. I think we all have some sympathy with that view, along with where relevant to the case and where convictions have been achieved, implementing the vicarious liability provisions of the Wayne Act, to send the message to landowners that they are responsible for the actions of those they employ. But first of all, you have to catch these criminals, and the difficulty is that these barbaric practices are mostly, although not always, carried out in remote rural parts where there's unlikely to be anyone around. And isn't it the case they'll continue down the path they do, not because of the nature of the punishment they risk necessarily, but because they believe there's little chance they'll ever actually be caught? There's a £26,000 reward and offer for information leading to a successful prosecution of these, those responsible for the Black Isle incident. The fact the police thus far have failed to charge anyone possibly illustrates the fundamental difficulty in catching these criminals. That said, when hotspots emerge, and there are one or two of these in the northeast of Scotland, then surely these should become the focus of intention, intensive attention and consideration of general licensing arrangement, as mentioned by the Minister. 
But, presiding officer, I think we also need, in the interest of fairness and balance, to acknowledge that we aren't talking here about every estate being involved, nor a sizable number of gamekeepers being caught up in these barbaric practices. The, rea the reality is nothing like that. There is undoubtedly a problem, an unacceptable problem out there, but it's important to get this in an appropriate perspective. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association has demonstrated that when its members are found guilty of this sort of behaviour, it will act. Three SGA members have been expelled from the organisation for wildlife crimes involving raptors in the past 18 months. And I know Scottish Land and Estates have made crystal clear to their members that there is no place for raptor killing within their ranks. But of course, this is a serious problem, it's a serious matter, and we need to find a way to catch the perpetrators and make an example of them. I therefore welcome the measures announced by the Minister today. But I wonder also if we perhaps need to consider the introduction of a brief amnesty on the chemical carbofurin. Over the past eight years, some 28 e eagles have been found dead on or have disappeared from Scottish grouse moors. And I understand uh, that of these, 15 were poisoned either by carbofurin or through a lethal concoction involving carbofurin, which is, of course, illegal in Scotland and highly dangerous to humans as well. Such a measure would undoubtedly prove controversial, and perhaps it's naive to think that people who have gathered such poisons would be prepared to hand them over. But we have, I think, reached the point where any measure which has the potential to reduce the threat to Scotland's birds of prey needs to be considered. And having had such an amnesty, we could, might I suggest, then greatly increase the penalties for being in possession of carbofurin, let alone using it. Thank you very much. And I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this debate is timely um, as we're in the grips of what would appear to be a cereal bird poisoned in a small area of Rosshire. This appears to be an overt act of cruelty and the perpetrator needs to be caught and feel the full force of the law. It's even more destructive given the work that's taken place to reintroduce those magnificent birds into the area and that reintroduction has provided many people with a great deal of pleasure and I for one have really enjoyed watching those birds in Easter Ross. I would ask the Scottish Government to assess the barriers to detection and prosecution in this case and if need be amend the law accordingly. I would also ask for consideration of an amnesty for pesticides and poisoning. And I understand the Minister, in his opening remarks, talked about removing toxic substance from our countryside. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say that in close, about that in closing. Because a lot of those could be lying about in houses and barns, undisturbed for many years. And they, when they're there, they could fall into the wrong hands, or indeed the packaging could disintegrate and the poison could become open to birds and animals. An amnesty would make sure that we remove them from circulation altogether. Uh, presiding officer, I have the privilege of being the species champion for the golden eagle and have, through my work with that species, been given an insight into the value of these birds, not just to our tourism industry, but to local people alike. If we look back in history, raptor killings in Scotland, we can trace them back to the 18th century when these birds were deemed by landowners and farmers to be vermin. It was also around this period that game hunting became really fashionable and all birds became a victim of this sport. Displaying such birds as stuffed ornamental pieces was also fashionable during the Victorian era. As a result, in many of those birds became extinct. It was not until the introduction of the Protection of Birds Act in 1954 that poisoning, trapping and shooting of raptors was made illegal. I think the vast majority of people now recognise the beauty of these birds and really appreciate the protection they're given. In recent years, police have set up wildlife crime units and they've worked in partnerships with organisations such as the RSP. RSPB, SSPCA and the NFU to try and address the issue. The main difficulty in identifying offenders is that these crimes take place in isolated and remote areas. Usually poisonings are uncovered by pure chance, by hill walkers, by people engaged in outdoor activity and the like. And that's why the poisonings in Easter Ross are so rare and that a huge an amount of birds have been found. Donald Dewar said raptor killing in Scotland was a national disgrace. I think it's something we should all be ashamed of and do our utmost to stop this horrible crime. Wildlife is a key element to our tourism industry and it, 
and it comes, and with it comes the obvious boost to the economy in sparsely populated parts of the country where scattered communities live. And wildlife tourism is in the increase when we see programmes such as the Hebrides eh, really portraying to the best our wildlife and encouraging people to come and visit the area. So we desperately need to come up with a strategy that stops wildlife crimes in our hills and glens. If we don't, then the image of Scotland as a land of wildlife, tranquility and beauty will be damaged beyond repair. While we have to, to protect these iconic birds for their own survival, we also have to act for the good of our wildlife tourism and the natural heritage of our countryside. Um, the offence of, and a few folk have mentioned this before, the offence of vicarious liability in relation um, to the persecution of wild life and it should have provided additional protection for birds however again we see that it's a very difficult crime to prosecute there is a defense that they did not know that an employee was engaged in such activity the other defense is that an individual took all reasonable steps to prevent an offense being committed this legislation should also be reviewed to ensure that it provides the maximum protection deciding officer in conclusion People involved in wildlife crime are criminals, plain and simple. They are seldom people who farm or care for livestock because these people have a natural affinity to living creatures, although I do recognise a minority do this. Others are just bad. They act out of badness with activities such as egg collection, badger baiting and the like, things we should all be deeply ashamed of and do everything to stop. The people who commit these crimes also break down the working relationships because they cause suspicion between land managers, conservationists and, and the community as a whole. I must ask you there is close. a duty on us all to stop these crimes and work together to bring criminals to book. Many thanks. Speeches of up to five minutes. Dennis Robertson to be followed by Liam McArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think like all members in the Chamber, I think we're all disappointed and saddened by the recent activity around the wildlife crime, especially within Rosshire. Presiding officer, um, I think I would probably want to begin by endorsing, I think, every sentence that uh, Rob Gibson actually uh, made in the chamber this afternoon. It's difficult to follow in, in some respects because it has been said. But, presiding officer, it's not new. It hasn't gone away. And the criminals are fairly innovative sometimes in how they try and deceive. Only last year, presiding officer, a golden eagle was trapped in the Angus Glens, a hot spot, as Graham Day has actually mentioned. But that bird was then transported. It had to be transported because its transmitter was on and it was at night time. And the golden eagles don't fly at night. So that bird was transported and then dumped in my own constituency in Aberdeenshire West near Aboyne. The bird's legs had been broken. The bird was left to die. Presiding officer, I can't for one minute think why someone would do such a thing and why they wouldn't even, um, why they would, would try and then take a bird from one area to another to dispose of it. Recently, we've just heard that the sea eagle in my own constituency, the sea eagle chick, has disappeared without trace. We don't know what's happened to the sea eagle. We have no idea. But we do know there has been activity within that area in the past. Quite rightly, the minister has said when there's ongoing investigations, we should not presume. But we have to ask, why? And what has happened to that chick? Last year, a red kite was shot near a boyne, again in my own constituency. A female bird who had successfully reared three chicks the year before. It was shot. It was deliberate. I've read the submissions from uh, many of the briefings and the ones from the Scottish uh, Gamekeepers Association that Jamie McGregor referred to. And yes, they say they're, they're doing all they can to try and encourage their members to act within the law. 
Why should we try and encourage people to act within the law? Surely we know to act within the law. They've said that about three quarters of the time that when they have their meetings is dedicated to this issue. But they also state in their letter about the general licensing. And it does make me question, are they spending more time talking about the licensing and how to obtain, or are they actually spending time on how to eradicate the well crime? And are they talking to their members to try and ensure that they are acting within the law and, and trying to ensure that everyone knows about the consequences if they don't? Scottish landing estates have done, I think, a fantastic job in trying to ensure that their members are, are aware of what's going on. And I think the partnership agreements between the RSPB, the NFUS and others is testament to the fact that we want to eradicate. We want to eradicate. We want to see the end of this abhorrent crime against our wildlife. Presiding officer, there may be a case for new legislation. But I think with the consultation that's coming for the SSPCA to have enforced powers, new powers, I think will probably enable better detection. And with the, with the DNA uh, in terms of our uh, detection, I think we will probably catch more criminals. But we need to try and be as innovative as the people committing these crimes. We need to try and ensure that where these crimes are being permitted, and after, if there are hot spots like Graham Day has suggested, that perhaps we have CCTVs. Perhaps we, we try and ensure that we can actually get the information we need and that that information is recorded to uh, effect prosecution. Could you draw to a close, please? Thank you. Presiding officer, I support the government motion and I endorse the motion from the Labour Party. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this has been a timely debate. I think the mood throughout has been fairly uh, sombre. And can I start by welcoming the Minister's motion? Uh, can I also welcome the unequivocal uh, words of condemnation in his opening uh, speech and also his acceptance of Claire Baker's uh, amendment, all of which uh, enjoy the, the, the wholehearted support uh, of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. I perfectly understand why he cannot ca comment on detail uh, on the case uh, in, in Russia that has perhaps prompted uh, today's debate, but as he himself uh, acknowledged, it's, it's clearly prompted public revulsion uh, and anger, including amongst members of the Land and Business Estates, NFU and SGA, as others have acknowledged. It has also, I have to say, tested the patience uh, of this parliament. As RSPB point out in their uh, briefing, it's on an unprecedented scale, uh, but it is far uh, from unusual. And what we are seeing is maps emerging of hot spots uh, around uh, the country. So I think it leaves us uh, with the question of what more can be done. I firmly believe that the Wayne Bill back in 2012 was a very significant step in the right direction. A range of measures that I think will prove beneficial over time. Uh, much consideration was given uh, in this debate and previously to the, uh, uh, to, to the introduction of vicarious liability. And I understand it's not uh, yet been fully tested in law, but I um, wholeheartedly welcome that move uh, by the Minister's predecessor, Rosanna Cunningham, who herself, I think, acknowledged this was not a panacea. It would not be straightforward um, to, uh, to, to, to prosecute, but I still think it was a move in the right direction. The bill left open opportunities to look at uh, other areas where I think uh, Parliament wasn't yet ready to take a view uh, and wanted further work to be done, penalties available to courts being uh, one such example. Uh, but there were three areas which I'd like to address where uh, I think we suspended judgment. Uh, one was in relation to licensing, one in relation to the SSPCA's role, which is now subject to a consultation, but also um, the capacity and expertise within Police Scotland, which Christine Graham uh, alluded to earlier. On the issue of, of licensing, and, and not the general license uh, 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 where there's a review, uh, which I, I very much welcome, 
I think I was of um, the opinion last time round that the, the concerns around the bureaucracy, the penalising of, of good estates uh, were, were well made. I was not persuaded at that stage that this was a route uh, down which we wanted to go. But um, the, the words of Peter Peacock I well recall um, from that stage three. And I think my own conclusion at that point was that um, uh, not now, uh, but when, if and when we have this debate again, the point of departure will be that some form of licensing will almost inevitably uh, be required. And I think the Minister appears to have come to uh, very much a similar uh, conclusion at this stage. In terms of the SSPCA's role, I, I, again, others have, have pointed to the potential benefit of increasing resources and improving the chances both of detection and bringing uh, successful cases. I remember uh, back in the consideration of the Wayne Bill, it was pointed out the SSPCA uh, was able to be involved up to the point of death, but not thereafter. Uh, and again, uh, I think while I saw difficulties uh, with, this, with extending that role uh, back at that stage, I, again, I'm increasingly of the view that this is probably now essential. And finally, to the issue of, of Police Scotland, we heard evidence at the time that there were areas of good practice. I think up in the North East was um, most often referred to as one such uh, example. Ministers promised that in the creation of Police Scotland, what would be delivered was greater targeted resources uh, and expertise. But I, I think very much share the concerns that Christine Graham was uh, alluding to in her intervention, that there doesn't seem to be any evidence uh, of that. The example I cited in relation to South Lanarkshire is but one example. I have ones from my own constituency, and I think um, there's a pattern building up that this doesn't necessarily have uh, the priority within Police Scotland, uh, we might uh, hope. In conclusion, Deputy President, um, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, is, as Graham Day uh, suggested, that there have been recent signs of improvement, but those appear to be on uh, the reverse. Police Scotland is struggling to cope or failing uh, to prioritise. The disincentives in place appear to be inadequate. Meanwhile, public anger is rising and the reputational damage is, um, I, I think, increasing. I very much acknowledge the steps taken by the Scottish Government today and the strength of the Minister's remarks this afternoon, but we need to up the pace and the intensity and ensure uh, that the worthwhile work underway at present is brought to conclusion and changes implemented without delay. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. And I now call Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Persecution and killing of raptors in Scotland is, as we know, a crime punishable at law, but it's also a crime against God's law. These beautiful creatures are innocents that God requires us to nurture, support and steward, and it ill behoves anyone to do them damage. The debate is certainly timely, and although the government is doing much to support wildlife, we must consider what additional measures and resources are required to eradicate for good these moronic crimes. But we must also look at this carefully before taking any action. The mass killing which has prompted this debate is very close to home for me. As it occurred exclusively around Conanbridge in Seaforth, which is in the east of my constituency of Skyloch Haber and Badenoch. The news of the killings, which broke over several days as more bodies were discovered, prompted a meeting on Monday the 21st of April at the Dingwall Mart, where I and Rob Gibson, MSP, met with the NFU Scotland, Highland Regional Chairman Jim Whiteford, uh, senior officers from Police Scotland and farmers from the Conan Bridge area, to discuss the, the situation at that time regarding the deaths around the village. Now, the police were not able, like the minister, to tell us too much about their investigations or how the birds died. And as a former animal health inspector, I can fully understand why that is the case. But the meeting was nevertheless a very useful meeting. I'm also very pleased that a group of the local farmers and landowners uh, from the area have come together and have pledged over 12,000 towards the reward fund for information about the deaths of these birds of prey which I think shows just how seriously they also view this matter. Uh, I think it's important to note as well that all of the birds that were found to have died appear to have died round about the same time. So although bodies were discovered days and weeks afterwards, it wasn't an ongoing, continuous 
poisoning that was running on that seemed to be one incident and we were only just finding the bodies of the birds. And I think it's important to note that. I'm also um, pleased that the Minister uh, has uh, put out the consultation on the SSPCA, which went out on the 31st of March, uh, with a view to looking at whether it would be wise to extend their investigative authority. Uh, but I would also ask the Minister if he has considered, and he may well have done, um, using the government and the local authority animal health inspectors. There's not a huge number of them, but local authorities do have responsibilities under the animal health laws, mainly in, in, in relation to animal disease and so on. And I was actually in charge of the... Sorry? Oh, yes. Jamie McGregor. Uh, I thank the member for taking intervention. When he was at the meeting in Dingwall, was, was it raised that it was some considered it odd that all, while there were 16 red kites and six buzzards had been found dead, that there, there apparently weren't any other uh, fatalities such as crows or seagulls? Dave Thompson. Well, there are all sorts of stories and rumours and suggestions about what has happened uh, flying around, many, many of them. The member has mentioned uh, another one earlier as well. I think we're better to let the police and the authorities get on with their investigation without speculating on these matters. That's good information that has, passed, has been passed on to the police, I know, but the best way is to let the police carry out their investigation. Now, as I was saying about the animal health inspectors, I hope the minister will uh, have a look at that. Uh, I was in charge of the Highland Council um, coordination in relation to foot and mouth back in 2001, where we coordinated all the different bodies. So there is a resource there that we could possibly use. Maybe we need to, to look at consolidating enforcement between the police and local authorities and we're now looking at bringing in the SSPCA and so on. So I think that whole thing maybe needs to be broadened uh, a little bit. I'll have to disagree with my colleague Rob Gibson here on tourism a wee bit because the Tolly Centre hosts several thousand visitors a year. The Tolly Centre at Bran Estate near Conanbridge, which I opened uh, a year or two ago. Could you draw to a close, please? Uh, are fed. Can I just say finally that we shouldn't be knee-jerk reacting to anything here. We need to find out exactly what happened first before jumping to any conclusions about what we need to do. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches. I call on Alex Ferguson. Maximum five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by saying that I very much welcome this debate, just as I welcome anything that highlights the utter iniquity of wildlife crime. But I'm also clear that wildlife crime is the result of the actions of just a very few people. Now, in no way does that in any way justify their actions. And I join with everyone who totally condemns those actions, especially where poisoning is involved. But we must keep these actions, these crimes, in perspective, as I think we have generally done during this debate. However, I think there are some engaged in the debate in the wider country whose comments do not do so. For instance, I do not think that recent comments by an RSPB spokesman stating that levels of wildlife crime, sorry, levels of wildlife crime were in danger of returning to Victorian levels has actually done this debate any favours because nothing could really be further from the truth. In Victorian times, we completely eradicated some species, species that we are now generally strongly supportive of, re of their reintroduction and the subsequent rebalancing of nature that man has done so much to destroy in the past. The Victorian era and the present day do not bear comparison. And to make it is, in my view, simply whipping up feelings, often against the landowning and gamekeeping fraternity in general, in a way that is I think totally unjustified and which is completely contrary to the partnership working that is exemplified through the workings of PAUSE, as recognised in the motion, uh, an approach that I totally endorse. When it comes to wildlife crime of any sort, surely we are all in it together. It should not, indeed it must not, become an us and them approach between specific sectors or organisations. This is an issue in which it surely is all of us against a very, very few individuals, as Rob Gibson and I think Graham Day both um, uh, referred to. 
And these individuals, of course, have no respect for the law and even less for the wildlife that the vast majority of us seek to protect and enhance. Up until 2013, indeed, as has been pointed out, we were looking at quite a success story in this regard with raptor poisonings reducing steadily from 30 in 2009 to 3 in 2012. Sadly, there has been a slight increase since then, which, is, which almost pales into insignificance when placed alongside the truly shocking incident in Russia that has killed at least 20 red kites and buzzards. Now, that incident is one I'm sure we all hope is the one-off that Dave Thompson indicated. But it is, however, imperative that the cause, and if there is one, a culprit or culprits are identified because there will be many and valuable lessons to be learned from this particular incident. It's easy to become a bit despondent on this issue, presiding officer. I, I don't think we should be too hard on ourselves. Scotland has a really good approach and a record of approach to wildlife crime. And it's an approach on which there is considerable evidence to suggest that it's been working. All trends suffer an occasional blip. And we should not lose sight of the encouraging downward trend that was in existence up to and including 2012. And it's for that reason, presiding officer, that we are, I'm afraid, unable to fully support the Labour amendment to this motion. We believe that existing legislation, especially where it was strengthened in the Wayne Bill, contains the appropriate measures that can be taken, especially as they still have to be tested to their fullest extent. We support increased penalties for those found guilty of these crimes, and we will support any measures that help to identify the perpetrators and bring them to justice, including increased powers for existing organisations. In short, presiding officer, and in conclusion, we support the government motion that is before us, and we will do so even if amended. We believe that the current work that is being undertaken by PAWS is immensely worthwhile, uh, and we would encourage continued partnership working to ensure that the downward trend that existed up to and including 2012 is first regained and then maintained. Scotland's wildlife, as the motion says, is indeed remarkable. The mindless actions of a very few individuals won't change that. And I have to say, I don't believe, like Rob Gibson, uh, that their actions will have a major impact on tourism because our wildlife is still remarkable despite this, uh, uh, these unpleasant actions. So let us use the powers that already exist and let us ensure that those individuals get the message once and for all. Their crimes are not just against wildlife. They are, they are against Scotland. And that, as first Donald Dewar and now Rhoda Grant has said, is a national disgrace. Thank you very much. And I now call on Claudia Beamish. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The consensus on eradication of raptor persecution sends a clear message to Scotland today, uh, and with the strong words from this chamber. It was a positive step that the Scottish Government has produced the first wildlife crime in Scotland report in 2012, for 2012. As a minister stated in the Ford, the aim is to establish a baseline of what is happening in Scotland. This, of course, can be built on in future years. The reports also sent a clear message, like today has, about the importance of tackling wildlife crime generally. And it also provided a clear focus for the Rural Affairs Committee, questioning of stakeholders and of the minister. However, as we have heard today from Rhoda Grant, Dennis Robertson, Dave Thompson, and many other members, all is far from well with the foul catalogue of recent attacks on raptors. As has been stressed today, though, partnership is essential in preventing and detecting wildlife crime. One Kind has asked for genuine partnership working with the Police and Crown Office, being prepared to, receive, to accept evidence from NGOs just as, as such as themselves and RSPB, rather than ruling it inadmissible before it even gets to court. Wildlife crime is so hard to detect, as we have heard, and evidence so hard to come by that it should be followed up vigorously wherever possible. And one kind suggests one, one way to approach this would be for Poor Scotland to issue guidance and encouragement to NGOs, as it already does to the public. The role of volunteers plays a part in partnership, and without their commitment to what is often round-the-clock vigilance, the prognosis would be bleaker. To see peregrines nesting in the, in the cliff crevices across the Clyde and soaring high above is a thrill indeed. They are protected by volunteers, and the Falls of Clyde Peregrine Watch, which was set up by Scottish Wildlife Trust to prevent egg thieves stealing the eggs during the nesting season, has been oversubscribed this year, which shows the public have a very strong interest in getting involved. 
Other partnerships are also significant. Moreland projects such as the demonstration project at Langham Moor, which I've recently visited, supported by the Game and Wildlife Conserv Conservation Trust, the Clue Estates, the RSPB, with scientific monitoring paid for, to take account of biodiversity as well as protecting hen harriers and other, and other birds, and the diversionary feeding, keeping more grouse chicks alive, along with other species, such as lapwings. Game has not been shot there during the project to enable grouse to return to a sustainable number. This is an interesting voluntary model, and I know the Minister has visited the project as well. The need, however, for consideration of the statutory regulation of game shooting should indeed be further explored by the Scottish Government, either for conservation purposes or indeed due to prosecution, pr prosecution if specific estates are named under vicarious liability in the future, which we hope they won't be. The culture has changed radically. Continuing education is essential, but there can be no excuse for any persecution for any reason. And raptor protection and detection of despicable attacks on raptors can only happen in remote rural Scotland if the partnerships which are already having success are further developed. These birds, which have been discovered, sadly, are unlikely to be the only fatalities as stressed, as stressed by NGOs in their briefings. Partnership must be adequately funded, and I ask the Minister today to reassure the Chamber that wildlife crime officers have the resources to do their job consistently, as has been raised by Christine Graham and other members. The consultation on increased SSPCA powers, highlighted by Elaine Murray, is to be welcomed in this context. The RSPB suggests that the bird of prey crime hotspots piloted by SLE are invaluable in targeting efforts to expose repeat perpetrators in my own South Lanarkshire, Angus, Inverness Shire, and other hotspot areas. It is right the Scottish Government is reviewing the wildlife crime penalties so that these are more robust and send a clear message. Since vicarious liability, which was supported by Scottish land and estates, has been on the statute book, there have indeed been no prosecutions, and my colleague Claire Baker has called for review. And Scottish Wildlife Trust argues rightly that any proven crime use the vicarious liability provision to send a clear signal to landowners that they must take responsibility for their staff. Can the Minister shed any light on why, apart from the present case in Stranra, um, he thinks there has been no, no um, prosecutions under this, under this law? And can the Minister also comment on the suggestion made by both Rhoda Grant and Graeme Day and others about a chemical amnesty and whether this would help um, for the future. There have been some arguments put forward that changes to protection arrangements for some species in some areas, buzzards being a case in point such as in England, might be a way forward. Though I understand from Scottish Wildlife Trust that while a third of pheasant fatalities are on our roads, only one to two percent have been recorded as being taken by buzzards. It is significant that the Minister agrees to conduct a study of licensing and game bird legislation in other countries, and I think this is um, something which we will all be able to work with, um, with him on together, I'm sure. Finally, our international reputation, in my view, is at stake to some degree, particularly at the moment, and it's something that the, the raptor eradication we really have to push forward on because of this. The excitement of seeing the vast wingspan of a red kite overhead at the Loch Ken RSPB reserve in my region is indeed breathtaking. You and need to bring your remarks to close. You. And the support of the feeding station, station is essential. We must not allow our reputation as a wildlife destination for iconic species to be, to be ruined and to become tarnished by these crimes. The raptors deserve our protection and this is something we must all work on together. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Paul Peelhouse to wind up the debate. Uh, Minister, if you could continue till five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you very much to uh, my fellow MSPs for attending and taking part in this important debate today and indeed for the quality of the speeches and the thought which they had put into them. And it was good to hear um, so many personal um, experiences. Uh, Lane Murray's experience, I think, uh, is one that will stick with me. And I look forward to seeing red kites in the field myself at some point in the future. Um, it is important that Parliament is able to send a clear, unambiguous message uh, that there is no excuse for persecution of our birds today. And I very strongly welcome uh, the broad support from all parties in the Chamber today in condemnation of the kinds of crimes uh, that have been committed recently. And 
and obviously we're still waiting outcome of the investigations in particular instance. But uh, we all uh, will need to leave. I think, as Dave Thompson very fairly said, we need to let the police do that work and uh, give us the, the truth of, of what has happened. Um, I certainly agree with uh, those who say that Scotland has much to offer. Alex Ferguson, indeed, Rob Gibson raised it first. Um, the fact that Scotland has a lot to offer in terms of a, a tourism destination, but I do think we, we run the risk, if this goes unchecked, of damaging the reputation of our country, particularly those who value coming to Scotland to see our wildlife. And I think we all revelled in the, uh, the, the Hebrides programme last year, which was a fantastic tribute to the quality of the environment we have in Scotland, and let's not see it tainted uh, by things like uh, raptor persecution. Illegal killings do affect Scotland's reputation as a brand, potentially, and I think that's something that we need to send as a message to all those who are involved in conducting it, that we will not tolerate that. Uh, recent events uh, involving red kites, buzzards, peregrines, sea eagles show that a range of species are at risk, including some of the rarest birds in Scotland. Um, I've already gone through in the speech, but just to recap, we have introduced vicarious liability. Parliament has endorsed the, the Wayne Act, and, and uh, we will see uh, what comes of that in due course. We have asked SNH to examine how they can restrict the use of general licences, as I say, where we have reason to believe that there is a wildlife crime has been conducted. And with support of the Lord Advocate, we have signalled uh, to, to police the encouragement to use the full range of investigative techniques to tackle wildlife crime. And I am looking forward to receiving Professor Pousty's um, deliberations on a wildlife crime penalties. I, I detect a strong sense in the Chamber today that people are supportive of strengthening action where that is deemed to be necessary, and uh, I'm sure Professor Pousty will have reflected on that too. Public consultation on, on extending powers of Scottish SPCA is something I promise to come back to and address a couple of points that have been raised by Claire Baker and others. So in terms of the consultation period, I think the, the, the length of the consultation period really is genuinely an attempt because of the complexity of the issue, the strong feelings on both sides and um, the strong public interest in this particular subject to allow the maximum possible scrutiny. I've borne the criticism in the past of previous bills and in the previous processes of not... Uh um, if we just finish this point, um, Mr. Robertson, I've, I've borne the, um, the, 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 the criticism of not giving adequate consultation. I'm not sure if it was Mr. Ferguson or perhaps um, others who've made that. So I think it's important we give an opportunity here for such an important issue uh, for the public and indeed stakeholders to have their say. Dennis um, Robertson. Give way to Mr. Robertson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. Would the Minister agree with me that we have an opportunity before us with the introduction of the agricultural shows coming into this season? to actually promote the consultation and actually to raise the aspect of wildlife crime and how people can get involved. Minister. I, I think that's a very sensible point Mr Robertson makes. Uh, certainly it's one we would want to have a strong, uh, broad-based representation from all views across uh, the industry uh, and indeed uh, from stakeholders in the conservation area. So I'll take that one forward to see what the possibilities are. Um, I, I think uh, it's also worth pointing out there was a number of comments about the potential for an amnesty uh, in relation to uh, the disposal of toxins. I'm thinking specifically, as was identified by Graham Day, in relation to carbofuran, but in indeed there are other uh, poisons, as people were aware, that affect wildlife. Um, my officials have been tasked at looking at a, an existing scheme to do precisely this. Uh, when I spoke about this at the Wildlife Conference at the Scottish Police College last week, I reiterated that possessing such a substance was an offence, but uh, also a risk to those who work in the vicinity of it and indeed their families. I'm not naive enough to think that everybody uh, will hand over their supplies as and when we're able to get something put in place. However, those that don't, and I think this is the point that Mr Day made, um, need to take cognizance of the fact that this, if they do ignore the opportunity to surrender such material and they are found in possession of it, I think it would be reasonable to suggest that more severe penalties might follow. But we do have to reflect the fact that we, we need to find a means by which people can be encouraged to volunteer this material so it can be surrendered and do it in a way that's safe and doesn't expose police officers or others uh, to, the, to the dangerous chemical. Uh, we will look at extending existing schemes, I see. Um, we have uh, obviously had a number of comments about the SSPCA, and, and I just want to return to that in respect of, I think it does potentially pose some advantages and disadvantages, so I think this is why we need to be clear on what it, it role it can provide. There's potentially a broad, as we set out in the consultation, a broader range of situations open to the SSPCA, for example, where there are no live animals present. Currently, they can't, um, can't intervene at that point. An additional specialist resource might be made available at no cost to the public purse to address the point about the degree to which we have adequate resources to detect and 
and indeed uh, prevent wildlife crime and potentially quicker response times in circumstances where police resources are restricted. I would point out, though, to Liam MacArthur and to others who have who have talked about, and Christine Graham indeed, um, that there were, as I understand it, a total of 41 individuals involved in the search in relation to the, the farms involved with Russia. Well, I'm not going to detail what they found or didn't find. Um, there were 41 people involved, and that shows a sense of the resource that was dedicated to that investigation. And we are able to pull in, um, as I think the point was made, about community officers, not just the specialist wildlife crime officers, but um, non-specialists as well, to support the police in their investigations. Um, Dave Thompson mentioned animal health inspectors. I do believe, I'll look at the issue he's raised, um, but we, we did involve ARPID staff indeed in the issue in uh, Ross There were ARPID staff who came in to support the police with that investigation, as did SSPCA, RSPB uh, personnel as well. So we are um, already trying to maximise the number of individuals that are involved, but I will take forward the point he raised and see um, if there's any uh, mileage in that. Um, I realise I've got a few minutes left, a couple of minutes left, presiding officer, just to raise a couple of other points that have been mentioned by members. Um, Jamie McGregor, uh, well, he, I strongly welcome his, his uh, support for the position we've taken today, raised the Sea Eagle Action Plan, an issue in relation to um, those who are crofting and farmers. I think it's an important issue. We have had a scheme in place to support uh, farms, uh, farmers and crofters who can demonstrate that their livestock has been affected by seagulls and we're look, looking to um, a, a next possible steps to continuing similar sort of support going forward. And we need to make clear to people there are avenues they can come to SNH for advice and support if they are encountering problems with any form of raptor which is perhaps impacting on their livestock. And so it's, it's not an excuse to go to, to persecute them. Uh, very briefly, if you may. Mr. Thank the Minister for taking that intervention. Would he therefore agree that it's quite important that before any reintroduction, like for example the reintroduction of sea eagles, that perhaps an impact study is done on what they are likely to eat before they eat it? Minister. Uh, well, there have, as, as the member probably knows, there have been two studies already done, one in the Gearlock, and, uh, which, which looked at particularly the impact of sea eagles and, and revealed that there was not the perceived impact on, on livestock that had been suggested. Uh, just in my closing remarks, uh, Presiding Officer, I just want to identify there were a couple of points made. Langamoor, I certainly recommend people to, to visit Langamoor to see what can be done in terms of diversionary feeding to help uh, hen harriers in that case to coexist with a uh, sporting estate. We also have uh, initiatives like Wildlife Estate Scotland, which is being put forward by Scottish Land and Estates, which also has uh, value in terms of allowing uh, landed estates to demonstrate that they can coexist happily with a vibrant raptor po population and to work with um, conservation interests to make sure both their sporting interests and wildlife are protected. But I, I do very much welcome, presiding officer, the very strong uh, signal that this Parliament has sent today about the condemnation of wildlife crime and in particular raptor persecution. And I endorse uh, the words that have been men mentioned by my colleagues across the chamber and hope it sends a strong, strong signal as possible to those who are permitting, uh, permitting these crimes to take place on their land or carrying them out themselves. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on wildlife crime eradicating raptor persecution from Scotland. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of a business motion 9940 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for Wednesday the 7th of May. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now and I call on the Minister to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. No members asked to speak against the motion. FRI now put the question to the chamber. The question is that motion number 9940, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. Um, we now move to decision time. The first question is that amendment number 9915.1, in the name of Kezia Dugdale, which seeks to amend motion number 9915, in the name of Aileen Campbell, on the National Youth Work Strategy, our ambitions for improving the life chances of young people in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9915, in the name of Aileen Campbell, as amended on the National Youth Work Strategy, our ambitions for improving the life chances of young people in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that amendment number 9916.3, in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 9916 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on wildlife crime eradicating raptor persecution from Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel the votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 9916.3 in the name of Clear Baker is as follows. Yes, 99. No, 0. There were 11 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment, sorry, is it motion number 9916 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse as amended on wildlife crime eradicating raptor persecution from Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.